Even though I haven't returned back to it in a little while, my series of weird Marvel and DC fusions is one of my longest running on this channel, and today's video is a compilation of all the previous videos in that series so far. Because it has run for so long, the quality in terms of art and storytelling dramatically gets better over time, though I will say, looking back, I do think there's some really good stuff in those early episodes as well. And I'm definitely open to returning to this series, so leave me some weird Marvel DC fusion ideas in the comments for when I get back from vacation. Also, leaving a like is always a good vote to get me to come back to the series. But anyway, let's get into it. Let's go. Hit like if you want. Subscribe if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. Barry Rogers grew to his late teens just as World War II was starting. He was eager to fight, but had been too small and in too poor health to enlist. But he thought he could fix himself and become an ideal soldier using science. Instead of exercising like a normal person, Barry decided to try creating a concoction that he could drink or inject to give himself superhuman abilities. He spent weeks in his lab experimenting to no avail, but on a faithful day, an accident would lead him to success. While carrying a bundle of failed formulas towards the trash on a stormy night, a bolt of lightning shot through his skylight window and struck Rogers. The vials all erupted onto him, and somehow the combination of the chemicals mixed with the supercharge from the lightning gave Barry the abilities that he so desired. He gained incredible inhuman super speed as well as impressive strength and durability. He was finally able to enlist and was accepted with open arms. Unfortunately, he couldn't carry a gun because at the speeds he ran at and because of the lightning that sprung from his body when he moved, the bullets in the guns would get superheated and explode. The only weapon that he would be able to use was given to him by another superhuman that he met during the war, someone that he would end up growing quite close to. The gift was a near indestructible shield that could hold strong even at his incredible speeds. It was made from a special metal from his new friend's home city of Themiconda, but we'll get to that later. Barry was a huge asset in the fight against the Axis, but on one faithful day while investigating a Nazi rogue science division, Barry was too late to stop a plane that was taking off on a suicide bomb run to the United States. By the time Barry got to it, the plane was just high enough that he couldn't reach it. Thinking quickly, he sprinted along under the plane, moving in a rapid circle, bolting faster than he'd ever moved before. He created a tornado that crept up under the plane and began to throw it off course. The plane was toppling enough that it started to spin out, but to keep the tornado going, Barry was having to run impossibly fast, even for him. Then, out of nowhere, just as the plane was headed for the Earth, Barry vanished. He had indeed saved the day, but he'd moved so fast that somehow he'd sent himself running through time. When he stopped, he'd run 80 years into the future. Despite his best efforts, he couldn't figure out how to control the time travel ability he'd unlocked, and he remained trapped in the 21st century. But in this modern time, he made new friends and continued to work as a different kind of soldier, simply fighting a new set of supervillains that were springing up in the modern age. And, of course, luckily, that superhuman friend he'd made during World War II was actually still around and kicking in this new era. Let's jump to her story next. Deep in the heart of Africa, there's a hidden city called Themiconda. It's an advanced city of long-living and super-powered women who keep themselves shut away from the world of men. They used to help in worldwide conflicts, but every time they did, the world would try to steal or exploit their incredible technology and abilities, so they eventually shut themselves away. But in the 19th century, a new princess of Themiconda was born, a girl named Chidana who would grow up to be queen and eventually was meant to take on the role of protector as the Panther of Wonder. As she aged, she grew more and more curious about the world of men. Because Themicondans age slower than normal humans, this young princess was only the equivalent of a human teenager when World War I began. She made a case for why Themicondans should help end the war, but nobody listened. 
Jadonna watched from the sidelines as the world went to hell, and even after the war ended, she continued to watch in pain as humanity suffered through the Great Depression, while Themicondans were thriving in their hidden society. By the time World War II rolled around, Chidana had had enough. She still wasn't old enough to take on the role of Queen and Panther, but she stole the impenetrable suit that the Panther was meant to don and went to fight alongside the Allies in the war. Her people discommunicated her, and whether she liked it or not, she was now exclusively a member of the world outside her home. And early on, this really worried her. She quickly became conflicted about her decision when she saw how black soldiers were treated and how women were treated in the world of men, and this made her wonder if the cruel world she'd just joined really deserved her help. But it was too late for her to go back now. She'd have to press on and keep searching for the hope she wanted to believe existed for humanity. Luckily, she met some who did keep the spark of hope alive, such as Barry Rogers, a superpowered warrior she fought alongside during the war. And even after his mysterious disappearance, she'd continue to fight and meet more people who showed her humanity's potential for good. And when the war was over, she turned her attention to fighting for the rights of women and minorities, becoming a hero on a new front. As she helped many brave souls bring positive change and progression to the world, Themiconda started to believe in humanity once again, and by the time the 21st century rolled around, they agreed to open their doors to free trade with the rest of the world, and they forgave Chidana for her past perceived crimes. There was still a lot of work to be done, but Chidana had finally brought together her world and the world of humanity. And to make things even better, not long after that, her old friend Rogers mysteriously reappeared, and Chidana was reacquainted with her long-lost friend. And they'd soon find that they'd need each other in the coming years. Bruce Blake had always had a very fuzzy memory of his early life. His guardian and butler, Laufred, had told him that as a boy, his parents had been killed by a mugger who'd also shot Bruce, though Bruce had lived and just suffered some serious memory loss. And while Bruce didn't remember this, he accepted it as the truth, but did little with this information. He had inherited a large fortune from his parents and used that as an excuse to never really work very hard. In his teen years, despite being very naturally smart, he put little work into his schooling and spent a lot of his time partying and drinking and getting into fights. Fearing the road that young Blake was headed down, Laufred one day took Bruce to the neighborhood his parents had been killed in. Crime Alley was run down and dangerous and filled with many people who were perfectly innocent, but who were down on their luck and couldn't afford to live anywhere else. It was an area nobody wanted to go to, and few had made much effort to help. Hurt to see that in the ten years since his parents' murder, this area hadn't improved at all, Blake decided to use his fortunes to help it. He built a new school, fixed up buildings, but in the time that he was doing this, the crime rate wasn't decreasing. Innocent people were still being killed, and Bruce didn't know what to do. One day, he went to the graves of his parents. They'd been buried in a cave on the Blake Manor property, and he knelt before them distraught. He asked them what he could do to help people so nobody else would suffer their fate in his home city. It was the first time in his young life that he was truly acting selflessly. As a tear rolled down his cheek, the cave began to rumble. The earth beneath him shook and the dirt began to part as something came up from the ground. From the earth sprung a great axe. Confused but curious, Bruce reached for the axe. As he grabbed it, he felt a huge surge of strength fire through his body. Not only did he gain incredible power and flight and a litany of other abilities, he regained his lost memories. His mind raced as he floated up out of the cave with a swarm of bats circling around him. He remembered that his parents had been the great old Nordic gods, Odin and Frigga, who had come to live out quiet, humble lives on Earth to raise their sons amongst humanity. 
But they'd put all of their godly abilities into this axe, making them mortal, swearing to only use the axe if they desperately needed to. Now, wielding it, he had all the powers of a Norse god. But with these memories, he also finally recalled that he hadn't been shot that night that his parents had been murdered, and along with that, he had a brother. Loxie had also been there that night, and as their parents lay dying, Odin had told the boys about the axe and where they could find it. Loxie had immediately gone for it, but had been unable to wield it, as it could only be lifted by a worthy soul. Wanting the power for himself, he erased Bruce's and Laufred's minds of his own existence and of the axe and their past lives so that he, in the meantime, could go figure out a way to claim the axe for himself. Now, with Bruce's memories returned and his abilities granted, Blake could use these powers to fight criminals in Crime Alley and even across the rest of the world. But he could also go find his brother and see if there was any way to reconcile their relationship. Unfortunately, it would be a difficult task, given what had happened to Loxie since. Wandel had just been a baby when her dimension was being torn apart. In her world, humanity had unlocked all the incredible potential of magic, and it had been used for generations to enhance all humans at birth. She and her twin brother, Pietel, were enchanted with abilities that would manifest as they grew. But the overuse and abuse of magic in this world had led to many giving themselves too much power, and it was far too easy for a few bad eggs to cast black magic enchantments that brought the dimension to its knees. Magnell, Wandel's father, foresaw the coming destruction and knew the only way to guarantee that his children would survive was if he sent them to another dimension. He'd hoped to join them there, but after he cast them away, they'd never hear from him again. The twins arrived in a flash of light in the middle of a field in Kansas, in a dimension that was still unaware of the possibility and existence of magic. Pietel and Wandel were found by the farmer couple who owned the field and were taken in and raised by the Kents. The renamed twins, Wanda Kent and Peter Kent, initially grew up unaware of their magical origins, but as they aged, the spells cast on them at birth slowly kicked in. Wanda found that she had incredible strength and flight along with a huge range of other abilities that she could unlock with the right magical training. Peter's magical skills didn't come as quickly, and his power was less extensive, but he did have incredible super speed, similar to that of an old, well-remembered World War II hero. Eventually, the Kents would tell Wanda and Peter of their history, and Wanda would become inspired to use her growing abilities to help this world. And if humanity would eventually learn to use magic, she would help guide them to use it only as needed and to only use it for good. She donned a cape and suit made by her loving foster parents and took to the nearest city to save any in need. Peter would occasionally assist her, but he was less inspired to be a hero than his sister. But one day she would call on him for help with a particularly powerful opponent. Loxie Lutherson, a billionaire who'd been conning the world for years into thinking that he was a charitable, upstanding member of society, was secretly using a type of primitive but very powerful Nordic wizardry to manipulate people and gain power in a world ignorant of magic. Wanda had clashed with him before, but now to confront her, Loxie had built a magic-powered mechanical armor to finally defeat her. She called upon Peter for help and he answered. The two fought well, but while Wanda's power was enough to protect her from Loxie's blows, Peter wasn't quite so strong. Loxie killed Peter and shattered Wanda's heart. It was enough to almost bring her to kill Loxie, but she stopped herself, knowing murder wasn't the way to a brighter tomorrow. She defeated Lutherson and sent him to prison, finally having sufficient evidence of his crimes, seeing as how their battle was very publicly broadcast on TV. She mourned the loss of her brother, but their battle had caught the attention of other heroes of the world. Becoming more aware of how many super beings there were, and how many more 
possibly villainous, super beings could be popping up soon, these heroes decided to band together and create a team that could protect the Earth from any impending threats. Odin Orion and Frigabard had never intended to tell young Loxy Blake of his true parentage. He'd been told that he was their son, but truly he was the child of an affair between Odin and a mortal woman who died giving birth to Loxie. Frigga forgave Odin's betrayal of her, but deemed that they should bring their other son, Bruce, to Earth and live as a mortal family alongside Loxie. As a half-breed or a demigod, Loxie wouldn't have been allowed into the godly realm of Nugengard, and with his biological mother dead, he had no family on Earth. Frigga refused to see the boy abandoned, so they brought a mountain of gold, adopted the last name Blake, and they began their new mortal lives, trapping all of their godly powers into a great axe that was hidden away in a cave on their new earthly estate. But Loxie had learned of his secret parentage and spent much of his young life teaching himself any old world magic that he could learn, using the fragments of godly abilities that lingered in his body. But he felt he deserved more. He despised the fact that his entire family had given up their powers simply because he was half human. He still felt it was his and their birthright to be all powerful gods. But when Odin and Frigga were tragically killed, they revealed the location of the Great Axe, and despite being told to only wield it if he truly needed it, Loxy immediately tried to claim it. But it wouldn't budge for him. Loxy decided that if he couldn't have the full power of the axe, then nobody could. He erased his brother's memory of their godly origins and of Loxy's existence, took half of the family's fortune, and fled to lead a new life. He took his biological mother's last name, Lutherson, and started building from scratch what would eventually become the world's most successful tech company, LoxCorp. Of course, to build much of their technology and to win over business partners, Loxy would often use the few magical abilities he had, manipulating people's minds and essentially forcing people to invest with him and make deals with him that meant major losses for his competitors which made it much easier for his company to grow. His shady practices would eventually be discovered by reporter Lois Urich of the Planet Bugle, who would relay the information to a new budding hero, the Super Scarlet. A hero that Loxie would come to despise, both for the fact that she made it her mission to unravel all of his crimes, but more so because she was powered by magic on par with what he could have if only he'd been able to wield his family's axe. He'd eventually go mad enough with hatred and envy for her that he'd build himself a part magic, part technology armor to face off against her. And despite him being eventually defeated and imprisoned, Loxie was quick on the path to orchestrating his escape from prison to clash with the Super Scarlet once again. Slade Thanson was the pinnacle of skill for soldiers. He joined the American army at a young age and proved to be an incredible asset in raids, stealth missions, and really any operation that needed doing. But there was one mission that had eluded completion since his earliest days as a soldier. In the drought-ridden country that Slade was deployed in, there was an unnamed warlord who every few years would take a band of terrorists to a small town and kill off half the population, seemingly with no motive. Slade and the others who were hunting him down believed he did this if villages failed to pay him for protection, but they were never actually certain. This mysterious sadist was the scourge of Slade's existence. Thinking about hunting him down kept Slade up every single night. On one occasion, Slade's troop managed to finally track down a hideout of the terrorists, but when they tried to sneakily approach, they were ambushed. 
Slade was badly wounded and on the brink of death, but on a whim he agreed to participate in an experimental super soldier program that could save his life as well as give him inhuman abilities. And to everyone's surprise, this actually worked. Slade was saved and became the first person to live through this experiment and come out the other side with enhanced strength, speed, and durability. But it also warped his body, shifting his skin to a dark shade of purple. But Slade wasn't a vain man, and the altered appearance didn't bother him, so long as he was now more equipped to hunt down his foe. Once more he tracked down the Warlord, but this time he was prepared. Slade's troop was slowly picked off through the fight, but Slade made it through the fire. He slaughtered the terrorist's band and finally got the Warlord at sword point. It was a moment he'd imagined for years, but it didn't go as he expected. The Warlord laughed at Slade, telling him that he knew Slade thought he was being a hero, but in truth, the Warlord deemed himself a necessary evil. The Warlord told Slade to go to any of the villages that he'd been to in the years prior, and Slade would see that now they were thriving. The drought that plagued the country for decades had meant that there weren't nearly enough crops to feed people. But in places where he'd killed off half the population, the remaining people had plenty to eat and drink. Slade hesitated for a moment, thinking on the words, and in that moment, the warlord pulled out a gun and fired it right into Slade's eye. Instinctively, Slade swung his blade and ended the monster's life. Slade's superhuman abilities had helped him survive the shot, but his eye would never fully recover. But the Warlord's words had stuck in Slade's mind, and he couldn't help but investigate if what he'd said was true. And to Slade's dismay, it partially was true. All the villages that the Warlord had attacked did indeed have more than enough food and water for all, even in times of intense drought. Of course, if Slade had taken the time to speak with the people, he would have discovered how many of them were traumatized by the loss of their loved ones and were depressed and had PTSD, but ignorantly looking from afar, Slade only saw the benefits of the Warlord's actions. Not only that, but Slade decided that this needed to be enacted on a worldwide scale. He thought that if this had helped small towns, it could do that much more for the rest of the world. But even with his incredible speed and strength, Slade couldn't do this alone. He'd need like-minded warriors with incredible abilities of their own. So Slade left the army and set off to find the Legion, with which he'd enact this vile, cruel, yet arguably well-intentioned plan. I'm gonna pull a corridor crew here really quick and take a look at what percentage of people who watch these videos are subscribed. 28.9%. So 71.1% .1 of people who watch and enjoy these videos are not subscribed. What's up with that? If you like the videos, subscribe. Then you get to see them right when they come out. And I'm pretty much always replying to comments in the first hour of a video's release. So you can come say hi to me as the video's coming out. But anyway, regardless of what you do, we're moving on to the second half of the video. Now, as previously established, Odin had a bit of a shady history, and while well, Frigga knew of his affair that had led to Loxie's birth, she never discovered that centuries earlier, another affair had led to the birth of a demigod named Elecane, who remained on Earth. Odin had loved this daughter and frequently came down to Earth to fight alongside her and the Vikings she lived with. Odin reveled in the occasional battle, but as they fought more and more, Ella's bloodlust continued to grow. She kept pushing the Vikings to invade and pillage more and more territories. Odin feared that with the powers she possessed, she could end up leading her warriors to overthrow the entire planet. Hypocritically, he thought this was too much power for her to have over the Earth, so he sealed her away in a magical chest and cast her into the sea deciding he'd figure out what to do with her at a later date, but really he'd eventually just forget about her. He wasn't a great guy. But upon his untimely murder centuries later, her tomb was unlocked, and she arose from the depths of the sea full of rage and completely lost. After days of swimming aimlessly, she was found by a submarine captained by modern-day pirates who called themselves the Mantas. 
They picked her up expecting to use her for ransom, but she quickly proved her skills as an ally and would eventually become their leader, being referred to by the band as the Hell Manta. With her demigod powers combined with their technology and modern day savvy, they became a formidable enough crew to even enact raids on the great underwater city of Atlantis. But of course, this would eventually lead her to blows with someone who would soon become her arch rival, a half Atlantean hero who's particularly difficult to beat when he's angry. Believe me, you wouldn't like him when he's angry. Our next villain's origin takes us back centuries ago to the fall of the Old Gods and the rise of the New. You see, the Old Gods who'd watched over Earth and other dimensions of the multiverse had been a feudal bunch. They eventually went to war with each other and killed themselves off, leaving behind their sons and daughters to pick up the pieces of their fallen empire. Odin Orion and Frigga Bard, who we mentioned earlier, were made the rulers of New Gengard for a time, but for this tale we are going to focus on the panther god Eric Uxes, who desired to rule over the hellish wasteland of Apocavalier. Uxes essentially wanted to be left alone. He found the presence of other biological life to be distracting and unnecessary noise. The only place that he could be free from all other life was on Apocavalier. Unfortunately, this honor had gone to his older brother Drax, and Uxus had been relegated not even to Earth, but to a single city on Earth, Themiconda. The city of superhuman women had been created in Africa by the old gods as an ambassador city between the gods and humanity. And this was back before Themiconda had isolated itself from the rest of the world. Human farmers and tradesmen came and went freely to and from the city. Yuxas grudgingly took over watch of the city, but secretly schemed about how he could kill his brother and take over Apocavalier. He never grew to like the Themicondans, but he respected their lifestyle. They trained hard, were strong-willed, and had firm, unshakable laws. He tried to pretend that he didn't care for them, but after years of watching them, he would develop a passing fondness. And they'd grow to respect him, as they did all the gods, even basing the queen's armor off Eric's own godly, panther-like appearance. But one day, Uxas noticed a boom portal opened in the farmlands of Themiconda. Eric's brother and some of the other gods were ushering some of the human farmers working for the Themicondans inside. When Eric inquired what they were doing, Drax explained that they were going to see if Apocavalier could be turned into a livable environment. This enraged Eric on multiple levels. For one, his silent, barren paradise that he'd hoped to claim someday was being ruined with sentient life. But along with that, the gods were essentially throwing these humans to their death on a whim. It was very likely they wouldn't survive the harsh conditions of Apocavalier, and the gods just didn't care. Yuxas had finally had enough. He went to the queen of the Themicondans and told her that he wanted to lead them in a war against the new gods, to free the Themicondans from the oppression of these thankless overlords. He saw this as a win-win. His brother would die so he could claim Apocavalier, and the Themicondans would be free to live as the most powerful beings on Earth. But to his shock, they refused. They understood that human lives were being risked, but deemed that the other gods must know best and accepted that it was worth risking those human lives. Yuxas never felt so disrespected in his long life, and that was the moment that Eric Yuxas lost all respect for any other sentient beings. His last shred of morality stomped out by the negligence of a society unwilling to act to help their fellow beings. He left his post in Themiconda, vanishing into the cosmos to train and build himself an army of mindless drones. Over the centuries, he slowly became more and more powerful, eventually becoming the most powerful of all the new gods. He led his drone army to Apocavalier, killed his brother, and claimed the world for himself. But now, he wasn't simply satisfied with ruling over this barren realm. He felt all sentient life deserved death and he would take his army realm by realm, destroying all of the living beings in the multiverse. With 
more and more metahumans appearing in the world, many of whom were criminals that were adept at escaping from prison, Amanda Fury made the executive decision that Earth needed a prison in space, one that would be far harder for metahumans to escape from. Using her connections, she got this approved, and the orbiting lockup was built, with her as its warden. But she had another idea in mind for the residents of this space station. She intended to use some of the most cunning and dangerous inmates as her own personal hit squad, to be sent on missions across the galaxy, taking out potential threats to Earth before they could even think to come to our planet. Let's go through some of the selected soldiers, shall we? First up is one of the strangest cases, an anthropomorphic raccoon with a thick Australian accent. Not even an Australian creature, and not even created by an Australian. Rocky Harkness was a cockney mad scientist with a strange obsession with the outback. It seems while experimenting on a poor raccoon who was intended to aid in the heists by being able to climb into small areas and disable security cameras, all Harkness was watching in the background were Australian-focused movies, many of which had some ridiculous Australian stereotypes in them. So as the raccoon was being brought to sentience, it learned all its language skills and interpretations of what humans are like from those movies, leading it to have a thick Australian accent and an obsession with boomerangs. Eventually, this raccoon would become smart enough to equip its boomerangs with dangerous explosives and razors and other such weapons. Down the road, the raccoon would become too smart for Harkness and find a new ally to enact heists with. Someone who is arguably an even more bizarre case than himself. But we'll get to that thing later on. Now, if you've seen the Avengers and Justice League mashups, both the heroes and the villains ones, you know that in those episodes I was trying to go with weirder combinations of characters because lots of people have done, like, Thanos and Darkseid combined or Superman and Captain America, and I wanted to do something new. But with Suicide Squad and Guardians of the Galaxy, I haven't really seen any people mashing up those characters, so I felt less weird about doing some combinations that made a little bit more sense. With Rocket, the combo that I felt made the most sense was either Captain Boomerang or Harley Quinn. And honestly, the only reason I didn't mash him up with Harley Quinn was because I really liked the sound of Harley Quill. I thought their names just fit better together. So, we got Captain Boomerang Rocket, and I'm really glad I went with this because I love how this drawing turned out. Next up, we have Gamora Lawton. She's the adopted daughter of ex-military hero turned supervillain madman Slade Thanson. Apparently, when he left Earth in search of alien beings willing to join in his cause to help wipe out half the life on Earth, he met Gamora, orphaned and alone. He took her in and began training her as a master assassin. She's not only incredibly skilled with a sword, but also has perfect aim and can hit any target in her sight with her arm-mounted guns. Under her father's orders, she's killed dozens of people on Earth and likely many more across the galaxy as she's searched for people to join her father's cause. But recently, she betrayed Thanson, apparently thinking he was taking things too far. Maybe, you know, she finally clicked that, hey, killing half the people on Earth won't solve everyone's problems, and killing people is bad in general. But, you know, obviously after you murder a bunch of people, you're not given a get-out-of-jail-free card just for realizing it was a bad thing to do. She was finally caught and imprisoned after Thanson left her pinned to a wall, impaled on her own sword. We still don't know if he intended to leave her alive or not, but if he didn't, then he is sure to come back after her to finish what he started. And if he did, then the prison would need to take even further precautions, as her capture could be a ruse for her to find more villainous assets to join in Thanson's cause. Either way, she'd make a perfect asset for Fury's team, as she was widely regarded as the most deadly assassin in the galaxy. Now this combination, I think, makes the most sense out of all the ones in this video, because, I mean, Deadshot is often referred to as the deadliest assassin on Earth, and Gamora is often referred to as the most deadly woman in the galaxy. So, you know, that seemed to fit pretty well. And one thing that I really started to notice with this drawing, and with a bunch of the other ones in this video, is the costumes that I'm making for these characters really aren't my usual go-to superhero or villain aesthetics. Because, 
just the costumes in Guardians and Suicide Squad are less superhero-y and more scrappy, scavenger kind of... I don't even know what term to use for them, but they're really not superhero-y kind of costumes. Except for some of the more comic booky Suicide Squad costumes that I pull from a little bit for the characters. I do some movie stuff, some comic stuff. And while it's not my usual kind of designs, I think it makes for some cool variation from my usual stuff. I'm curious to see what other people think of them. Anyway, here is our Gamora Deadshot. Don't really have a good name for her. Next is by far the most vicious of the group. We believe his original name is Nanawe Douglas, but everyone we've talked to just calls him Shrax. We believed that he was another alien, though he'd always claimed to be the son of a Polynesian shark god. We'd had our people looking into what planet he might be from, but with heroes and villains like Super Scarlet and Loxie Lutherson recently being revealed to have their powers stemming from magic, all bets are off, and it's entirely possible that Shark Boy here is the son of some god. He is incredibly strong and fast, and has a nasty habit of biting his enemies in half. He carries two knives with him at most times, but usually just opts to use his teeth. Lately, he's been on a rampage across the Earth, searching for the dear old man of Gamora. After she and Thanson had separated, Thanson killed Trax's wife and daughter. To me, the more shocking thing there is that someone married and had a kid with a shark man, but I guess weirder things have happened in the world. Putting this big old brute on the same team as Gamora could be bad considering the fact that her dad killed his family, but if she really has betrayed her father, then who knows, maybe they'll get along well. Now for Drax, the two possibilities that I saw were either King Shark or Killer Croc, and honestly the only reason I ended up going with King Shark is because I've drawn lots of stuff that's more Reptilian. Obviously, I've done lots of dragon videos on this channel, and I drew Killer Croc in my last Batman Dungeons & Dragons episode. I've never drawn King Shark on here, so I was like, alright, let's go with that. And obviously, this combination of characters was super easy to do, because they're basically wearing the same kind of thing. I was basically just drawing Drax as a shark-shaped humanoid character. That might have made the design a little bit too... I don't know, simple-ish and boring, but I kind of like the simplicity of it. I think it's cool looking. I wish I'd tilted his head up a little bit more because it's hard to make a shark's eyeball look like it's looking up because they're very just kind of flat black eyes that I just add a bit of glint into. But besides that, I think this one's pretty cool. It looks exactly how I intended it to look. Next, we have Harley Quill. Originally from Earth, she'd just become a psychiatrist for the criminally insane when her mother got sick. On her deathbed, Quill's mother told her that her father, who she'd been told had died before she was born, was actually an alien who'd come to Earth and was now somewhere out in space. Harley couldn't let go of this thought and wanted desperately to find her father, but obviously had no way of getting to outer space. But she found an opportunity when she met a particularly insane patient of hers, the notorious serial killer Arthur Cassidy. For a time, he'd been bonded to an alien parasite that had given him superhuman abilities, but they'd been separated before Cassidy was sent to jail for the third time, where Quill was meeting and treating him. Quill was told by Cassidy that he could help find her old man if she could get him his parasite back. Arthur was a absolute madman, but he did have a mesmerizing personality in a crazy person sort of way, and Quill eventually fell for him and agreed to help him. She found and smuggled in his alien buddy and rebonded. they easily escaped from prison. Which, you know, is all the more reason we needed Fury's space station. Cassidy in a way kept to his word and took Quill out into the galaxy, but before they could ever find her dad, their relationship got pretty rocky. Quill eventually cut ties with Cassidy and returned to Earth, a lot more unstable and much more inclined to high-concept robberies. Her combination of a brilliant but twisted mind and some dangerous space weaponry she'd picked up in her travels made her a pretty formidable fighter and a perfect member to fight on Fury's squad. 
Now with Harley Quill, my favorite thing about this one is actually something that I've been working on a little bit recently, which is how I have her holding her back hammer thing. Basically, I've been working on just how I draw characters' hands when they're holding things in general, because it. what I used to do is just draw a character's fist closed and then draw a sword or weapon or whatever sticking out of it, but now I've actually been thinking more about the volume of the object in the character's hand, both in her hammer thing and her gun, and I feel like I am getting better at it, and this is one of my favorite cases of that recently, where I have her backhand really gripping around the handle of the hammer. Besides that, I think this one's fine. It's not one of my favorite designs. I don't love how the top part of her helmet kind of makes her look like a weird space golfer or something. But besides that, still think it's kind of cool looking. So here is our Harley Quill. Finally, we've got Coonerang's latest criminal buddy. Hard to get anything out of him because all he ever says is, I am Diablo. But the guards took to calling him Triablo, for obvious reasons. He's an alien being from Planet X, where some Earth heroes were recently on a mission. And on that mission, the long-running hero, Lazarus Blaze, also known as Diablo Rider, was killed. Allegedly, Lazarus got his powers from a spirit put into his body by the devil, and when Lazarus died, it went searching to find a new fitting host. I guess it decided that this weird plant monster was a good fit, and now this mass of shambling branches has all the powers of a fiery demon, which has obvious complications for a tree creature. Along with his own species' abilities to stretch his limbs into whips and weapons, he can now also ignite his entire body in hellfire. If he does that for too long, the fire will scorch his body to cinders, but so long as he stops for a long enough period of time, he can regrow his body to its normal size before using the fire powers again. Lazarus's teammate brought the tree back to Earth, thinking he could take Blaze's spot on their team, but while stopping one of the raccoon's heists, the two somehow ended up becoming close friends, and Triablo left his super team to join in the criminal life of Coonerang. He might be a weird, alien, devil freak, but Triablo is definitely a powerful asset to any team, and if he's put on a team with his raccoon buddy, he'll do whatever his little friend tells him to do. And with those five gathered up, Amanda Fury had found her team. Will they eventually become friends, find a way to escape her clutches, become a rogue superhero team fighting crime across the galaxy? Probably yeah, but I don't have time to fit that story into this episode, so, you know, we're done for now. Now this is off topic, but as I was recording the voiceover for the Harley Quill character, got me thinking about how many times do you think I've said, but besides that, I really like how this one turned out on the channel. Like I probably say that at least twice an episode for something like a hundred episodes now. Sorry, that's off topic. Anyway, onto the design of this character. It's probably pretty self-explanatory. I was taking some inspiration from Groot, some inspiration from the human version of El Diablo, and then also some inspiration from his full crazy skeleton doubt version. And for the story, I was looking back to the old West original versions of the comic character and some of the future interpretations. And this one I kind of picked to challenge myself from a story standpoint because it was the combination that made the least sense to me. Tree and fire. Don't know if I really stuck the landing on the story, but besides that, I like how this one turned out. <laughs> so here it is, our weird El Diablo group combo. Parker felt uneasy about his latest case. He swung through the city letting the hum of cars and rush of wind tune out the world so he could think. To a lesser detective it would seem completely obvious who was behind the string of killings. The venomous Bane of New Gotham, back at it. Ex-wrestler Edward the Bane Brock, who Wayne had once embarrassed in the ring just before the start of his heroing days, and his alien symbiote were once more a unified, super-powered villain tormenting the city. That's what a lesser detective would have concluded with the current evidence. The victim's wounds matched Brock's M.O. They had three spiked puncture wounds on their bodies and all looked as though the life had been sucked out of them. 
It was a cause of death Wayne had only ever seen from Brock and the vampire bat, Morbius Kirkland. But with Kirkland locked away in Arkhamcroft and Brock still out on the run, that left the alien enhanced wrestler as the obvious suspect. But something was off. These killings seemed too random, and in most cases, the victim's surroundings suggested far too much of a struggle. Bane was powerful enough to take out these victims quickly, and he wasn't the type to toy with his victims. He'd get the job done, then move on. Plus, he'd only ever killed known criminals in the past. These victims ranged from bankers to construction workers to psychiatrists. There was no consistency. But most unusual and eerie of all was the expression left on all the victims' faces. Their mouths stretched back an unnatural distance, giving their lifeless corpses a horrific grin. The whole situation seemed so cruel for Brock. He had been a killer once, but never a particularly sadistic one, though Wayne did still hold a bit of a grudge for the time Brock broke his back. But Wayne kept his personal feelings out of this to stay objective. Brock had allegedly reformed, getting full control over his symbiote to work as a vigilante hero in Brookhaven. Wayne wanted to believe that this was possible for even an ex-killer like Brock to reform. Still mid-swing, Wayne tapped his ear to call for an update. May, are the results in for the symbiote particle scans? Across the city, May Pennyworth sat in front of a myriad of computers, ready to give the unfortunately unhelpful information from the scans. All signs point to Brock. Symbiote remnants seem to match that of Brock's uncouth, helpful parasite. It seems he's not as reformed as we'd heard. But Wayne wasn't convinced. Yet. Any other criminals running around tonight? I need something to take my mind off this for a bit. Well, May said, there were silent alarms sounded at the new Gotham branch of Loxcorp. It's likely the authorities could handle it, but if you need something to do... Thanks, May. Within minutes, Wayne was at Loxcorp Tower's roof, and on the roof were three hang gliders. It seemed these criminals had planned on making a rather daring getaway. Wayne webbed up the gliders and perched himself on the doorway to the roof. Moments later, four thieves burst onto the scene, with notorious criminal and goof Kite Shock leading the charge. I should have figured it was you, Shocky. Wayne flipped from his perch and split-kicked two of the henchmen to the ground. He webbed them both up as the third goon whipped out a gun at the bat. Wayne spun a spider ring from his belt and jammed it into the gun's safety. The crook tried to shoot, but nothing happened. Wayne swiped a leg under him, knocking him to the ground. Three buddies this time? Do I scare you that much, Shocky? You're one to talk. Kite Shock said, oddly looking past Wayne. You bring a sidekick just to watch, or is he gonna do something? Wayne didn't understand, but before he could think, he was struck from behind and hurtled off the building. As he fell through the rush of wind, he heard Kite Shock and his goons screaming for their lives, along with a horrific, cackling laugh. Wayne spun himself around mid-air and fired his webs back up the building, saddened by this revelation. This must be Brock, Wayne thought, springing to the wall and sprinting back up the side of the skyscraper. My spider sense wasn't triggered by that hit, meaning it must have been Brock and his symbiote. But what's with that laugh? The screams and laughs got louder and louder as Wayne got closer to the roof, but just as Wayne sprung back onto the scene, the final screams ceased but a low, eerie chuckle still echoed in his ears as he looked upon this assailant. There you are, Batsy! Red and black tendrils reeled back into the figure before Wayne, who had similarities to Brock in his venomous Bane form, but certainly was not him. It's about time you met the new me! Wayne looked in horror at the four criminals now laying as lifeless husks, all grinning ear to ear. What are you? Wayne flung himself at the fiend, fist cocked. The figure twirled gracefully out of the way, chuckling as he did. Ah, oh, you wound me, Batsy. Don't you recognize your old pal Arthur? Or was it Jack? What name did I give you the last time? When Wayne landed, he swung himself back around to see that the alien symbiote was peeling back from its owner's face, revealing a familiar figure that chilled New Gotham's greatest detective. 
Arthur Cassidy? It was indeed the notorious serial killer that Wayne had locked away months earlier after a string of horrific murders. Alright, that has been my go-to name for our past quarrels, hasn't it? He flicked a hand forward and a barrage of tendrils flailed out, spiraling towards Wayne. Wayne flipped and spun around each strike. He was used to his spider sense helping him dodge these incoming attacks, but even without it, before he'd gotten his powers, he'd trained extensively with Roz the Mandarin. Cassidy would need more than that to catch him off guard. Or so Wayne thought. How did you get Brock Symbiote? Where is he? Brock Symbiote? Are you accusing me of being a thief? Wait, that's actually quite fair. <laughs> but not in this case. When my old cellmate Brocky Boy got a prison break from his symbiote pal, a little part of him split off and decided to give me a test run. Turns out we make a far more glorious pair than Brock and his half of this fun little suit. That explained enough for Wayne to know he had an easy win in this fight. He reached for his belt, but quickly noticed something was missing. Oh come now, Batsy, you didn't think we'd let you end this that quickly, did you? Cassidy chuckled as one of his tendrils returned, wrapped around Wayne's sonic grenade. A flash of tendrils spun around the grenade, quickly disassembling it, and it fell to the ground in pieces. You'll have to be a little more hands-on to deal with me. Wayne charged at Cassidy again, and Cassidy simply raised his arms and laughed, as if Wayne was coming in for a hug. Wayne tackled him off the side of the building, and the two tumbled through the air. Cassidy cackled in Wayne's ear. Wayne tried to hit his foe, but the killer held Wayne tightly in place as they cratered to the earth. Spider-Bat's warning alarms fired in his head as they shot towards the ground. Cassidy could survive this fall with his symbiote's aid, but it could have maimed, if not killed, Wayne. They fell and fell, shooting at terminal velocity to the street. When out of nowhere, they were struck from the side mid-fall. Cassidy flopped off Wayne, who was caught by a hulking figure that landed with him onto a low rooftop. I respect your fighting spirit, Spider, but this is not a battle you can win alone. Wayne took a step back from his savior. Before him was a new, altered version of his past foe, the Venomous Bane. But the reunion was quickly interrupted. Ah, look at this! The family's all here! Cassidy landed on the building side, grinning far too eagerly at the scene. Now we can really start the party. It was quickly apparent that Cassidy had been holding back. He ran into the fight, cackling as a swarm of tendrils erupted from his back, and his hands grew into sword-like claws. He flung the tendrils at Wayne, who flipped through most, but two struck him in the ribs and hurled him across the roof. Cassidy's claws met Bane's bare arm and cut three clean gashes into it. He flinched through the pain and sent a punch, rocketing into Cassidy's jaw. Cassidy flipped through the motion of the punch, leaping into a backflip like a dancer. For shame, Brock. With our little friend helping you, you should be hitting far harder than that. Wayne recovered and got his first long look at Brock. He was definitely different. While part of his body was clearly covered by the symbiote, he wasn't nearly as protected by it as he had been in the past. I was a fool once for letting it fully overtake me. A fool as you are now, Cassidy. I could teach you to regulate it and control it as I have, Brock said, gesturing to the tank on his back and the pipes connecting from it to the rest of his body. But something tells me you're a man who's never been truly in control of himself as it is. Sticks and stones, Brock. Besides, all you're doing is diluting the fun you can have with the full force of our twisted friends. He let out another maniacal laugh as he thrust his arms up and spikes erupted from his body, firing across the roof. Shards struck straight through Wayne's thigh and shoulder. His instinct was to cry out, but he didn't want Cassidy to have the satisfaction. With his unhurt arm, he fired a web into his foe's back and yanked him to the side. Cassidy let out an eerie, Whee! as he rolled across the roof. Spider-Bat leapt over to Bane. You got careless, Brock. You may not be a killer anymore, but it's still your symbiote killing people. This is on you. I know, Spider. And as such, I'll deal with it myself. He grabbed the center of his belt and spun it clockwise. A green light emitted from it, and a low hum could faintly be heard. Can you distract him for me? 
Thane said in a somewhat somber tone. Wayne didn't know what he was doing, but he nodded and leapt towards Cassidy. Wayne webbed as many of the tendrils as he could and stuck them to the roof as he went in for a punch. Cassidy snatched his hand and grabbed Wayne's shoulder, swinging him down, then holding him just off the ground. May I have this dance, Batsy? The fiend cackled as he raised a claw. This is gonna hurt, Wayne thought, as he allowed the claw to strike down into his side. Wayne then grabbed Cassidy's arm and tugged him to the ground on top of Wayne, fully exposing Cassidy's back to Brock. Brock's cannon-like arms wrapped around Cassidy and ripped him off Wayne. Oh, Brock, I promised I was saving a dance for you. Brock ignored the words and muttered quietly, as if speaking to his symbiote. I'm sorry, old friend. A shockwave rocked the rooftop as explosive sound burst from Brock's belt. Wayne's gadgets protected his ears, but both Cassidy and Brock yelled out in pain as both their symbiotes shrieked and shriveled away into nothingness. After a moment, the sound stopped, and Bane dropped to the ground. Cassidy had finally stopped laughing and now scoured the roof aimlessly. No! Where is it? What have you done? Wayne struck Cassidy in the head, knocking him out. He webbed the killer down, then looked to Brock, whose muscles were slowly shriveling away. Wayne knelt down next to him. Brock, what's happening? I had the symbiote for too long. My body can no longer survive without it. But you, Brock, put a shrinking hand on Wayne's shoulder. Let me be remembered for this, not for the man I was. His hand dropped. That's all I ask, Spider. His final words slurred as he shrunk down to skin and bone and breathed his final breath. Despite their checkered history, Wayne felt sorrow at Brock's death, and the slightest spark of hope was lit in Wayne, knowing that Brock, in his final moments, had indeed reformed, as he'd so hoped. In the very least, Brock had now ensured that no symbiote would ever cause harm to anyone in New Gotham again. Or so Wayne hoped. If you looked at the expression on Scott Grayson's face as he trained the night before the big mission, you likely would have read his expression as that of a bold, confident leader. But behind his crimson visor were eyes that betrayed concern and fear. Luckily for him, that visor never came off. Scott ran through his makeshift underground training facility in a blur, leaping and spinning from punching bag to combat dummy, kicking, swinging, tossing shurikens, and firing off rapid concussive blasts from his eyes. Every blow and move was precisely executed, but it didn't ease his tense mind. As he reached the end of the course, dripping with sweat, he pulled out his phone to check the weather. The following day called for torrential rains, exactly as planned. Stormbird was doing her job well, and Silosis had been practicing to increase the speed of his hacking all week. Scott's team was ready, and regardless of whether he was or not, he had to keep acting as though he definitely was. He headed off to his room in the still under construction X Tower, ruminating on the stakes of the following day. This mission was his best chance to prove to the world and to himself that he was truly ready to lead and start saving people on his own, as his mentor had been doing for a decade now. See, Scott had spent much of his teen years fighting as a vigilante hero alongside the Dark Norseman, Bruce Blake. But now Bruce was spending most of his time fighting off large-scale global and universal threats with the Avenging League. Surprisingly, his home of New Gotham had another bat-themed hero running around protecting the city, but still, with so many of the big-named heroes focusing on the huge problems of the world, nobody was answering the smaller calls, of which there were many. And this was where Scott Grayson, aka Nightclops, saw the greatest need for himself and for anyone who'd be willing to follow him. For now, his team was only made up of three people, but by the end of the day tomorrow, he hoped it would be much bigger. <laughs> this is it, comrade. Are you ready? Can you feel the pounding of the battle drum in your chest? 
I sure can, Sai, Nightclop said, perched on a branch just above the cheery Russian cyborg, looking through binoculars at a facility a hundred feet ahead. From the surrounding forest, it looked like a small, out of place, and unusually well guarded warehouse, but Scott and his team knew better. Sinking down ten stories beneath that warehouse was the Weapons Hive, a facility made to take young superhumans, enhance their abilities through whatever means necessary, and brainwash them to fight as a private army for Striker blood. A vile man who saw superhumans as a weapon to be wielded and nothing more. The winds rise, comrade! Our little goddess must be near. And with her drawing near, so does the battle. Scott usually enjoyed Victor Rasputin's overly cheery attitude, but at the moment he was too focused to enjoy anything. He actively controlled his breathing, keeping his nerves at bay as the breeze went from a light churning to a ripping flurry that rocked the forest and the facility. She is here! And that was their cue. Nightclops leapt onto Silosus' massive steel shoulder and the two stomped towards the facility. As hoped, the guards were scrambling and practically blinded through the pounding rain, but of course, they suspected no foul play. Silosus' arm clanked and shifted and reshaped into a red laser-like saw, and he sliced through the gate in a blink. Watching for guards, they both bolted for a panel on the warehouse wall. Sai's arm shifted again, and tubes spilled out from it into the panel circuits. Once more, Scott felt grateful he'd found an ally like Silosus. Sai had been caught in a collapsing building during the first major battle between Loxie Luther and the Super Scarlet years earlier, and the damage to his body would have been fatal if his metagene hadn't activated from the trauma. He gained the ability to shift his body into a full metal state at will, but he hadn't been fully protected, and parts of his body had still been damaged beyond repair. But his father was luckily a brilliant biomechanical engineer. He built cybernetic body parts for Sai and fused them to his body's own natural metals. Now he was not only a tank on the battlefield, but also a brilliant hacking machine and general tech genius. While he'd never show it, Sai's power made Nightclops feel like an inferior member of the team. You are in! The floor next to them creaked and slanted down, opening a ramp into a hallway. Out of Sai's arm sprung a small metal device like a remote. Here is your key. It will now open any door you need, except for ones headed to the Delta Wing. But I can still open those doors with more time if you've changed your mind. Not this time, Sai. It's too risky. But great work. Now, are you sure you're ready for this next part? Ready? Ha <laughs> Comrade, this is what I live for! Sai handed him the key and charged around to the front of the warehouse, in full view of the scrambling guards. His arm shifted into a crimson cannon that he fired at a truck sitting in the lot, which exploded and rocked the yard. Come and get me, hive scum! Intruder! Intruder! Fire at will! Hive guards shot a flurry of useless blasts at Sai as he rampaged through the yard, swatting away foes. With that bombastic distraction along with the raging rains, not a soul noticed Stormbird soar down to meet Nightclops at their open doorway. Is all going as planned? She asked in her often somber sounding voice. We're in, and I doubt they'll notice us with Sai making all that noise, but still we should move fast. At this point, Nightclops was still unsure if Sai would have time to accomplish his side mission, but either way, the Russian bulldozer was doing perfect work for them. And Stormbird had also played her part perfectly, leading the storm in over a few days so it wouldn't appear out of nowhere and be suspicious. Scott wasn't actually clear on the origin of her powers, as she didn't really like to talk about her past, but he did know that she used some kind of black magic to control the weather. He speculated that her powers could go far beyond that, but he never pushed her to try. She was already incredibly powerful. The two bolted down into the facility, often stopping to let guards sprint past towards the battle above. It took them 20 minutes or so to get past all the guards to their target, with echoing impacts still heard from above. But eventually, they found their way to the main containment center. Inside were 30 cells, all holding young metahumans that Stryker was using as lab rats. 
It made Nightclops' insides churn. Eight guards still stood watch in the vicinity. Okay, I can take the four on the left if you take the four on the right. Um, okay, if you say so. Nightclops opened the door and charged in, but before he even got three steps ahead, a streak of lightning shot from the doorway and blasted four of the guards. Everyone still standing stopped and looked at Stormbird in the doorway. Okay, Nightclops said, stepping out of the way. You can take all eight. She struck down the rest, and seeing her make such quick work of them, once more sparked a glint of doubt in Nightclops. Why were two godlike heroes taking orders from him? He was a good fighter, but it was like a mortal bossing around titans. His thoughts were suddenly interrupted by a series of thunderous crashing sounds that seemed to be getting closer and closer. Is that Sai? He shouldn't be coming this way. Boom! Sai did indeed enter the room, but he was hurled through the wall ahead of a figure even larger than himself, one all too familiar to Nightclops and his crew. Cindernaut, Scott snarled, which means that, yes, Scott. Her voice was calm and commanding. On a hovering rock into the room floated Magna Terra. Thank you for opening the door, but we'll be leaving with these recruits today. These aren't recruits, Terra, they're children. Scott sprung into action, firing an I-beam at Cindernaut that was barely noticed. The brute laughed and continued hammering Silosis, who was still reveling in the battle. A massive foot thumped Sai's chest, and he rolled across the room to Robin's side. Sorry, comrade, the big one is tough, even for me. Plasma blasts started firing into the room as Hive guards entered in a swarm. Everything was falling apart around Scott. Well, that poses a problem but I do have some good news. Some of the guards started to shriek and fire frantically in all directions. I had just enough time before the Sisterhood of Metahumans arrived for my little side mission. The guards were rapidly being mowed down by a stocky ball of claws and muscle that sliced through them all in a flurry of green and red. In seconds, the first wave of guards were in a clump on the floor. Sai laughed eagerly. Booyah, comrade! I see why he was in his own wing. But another swarm of guards charged in. The green brute's body suddenly shifted into that of a bear, still wielding the same long razor-like claws, and he started slashing through more foes. It was a help, but there was still a lot to be done. Sai, keep on Cindernaut. Stormbird, I know you're out of your element down here, but just keep Magnaterra distracted. I need to get these cells open fast. No matter what happens, we're getting these kids out of here. His words were confident, but his thoughts were spiraling. Luckily, his instincts were winning the fight in his mind as he ran through the room with Sai's key and opened all of the cells, telling the kids, we're here to help, but stay in your cells until it's safe to come out. He went through cell by cell, and as he just got to the last one, Stormbird was thrown to the floor by his feet. Silosis too was then hurled over to Nightclops. Magnaterra hovered over, floating a circle of boulders above her head. She seemed ready to make some kind of overconfident villain speech, but before she could, another being entered the room with another wave of guards. Well, well. Striker Blood stood with his two best attack dogs by his side, Jinx Strike and Saber Mammoth. How convenient you've all come to me. The guards all began firing a barrage of blasts as Strike and Mammoth charged in. Nightclops pulled Stormbird and Sai into a cell to hide from the blasts and regroup. His mouth hung open. He was frozen. It had all fallen apart in such a spectacular fashion, and now Nightclops even risked having the kids that he was meant to save getting hurt. He felt like he was in way over his head when suddenly a heavy slap knocked him out of his thoughts. Hey, bub, what's the plan here? The Green Beast had come into the room to wake Nightclops from his stupor. You're clearly in charge here, so what are we doing? Nightclops looked around the cell and saw that all eyes were on him. Despite all three of these heroes being infinitely more powerful than himself, and despite this whole plan having gone so wrong, they were all still looking to him for guidance. Even this new teammate, Logan Garfield, despite having never even met Scott, had recognized from his quick decision-making in the battle and from his drive to save the kids that he was a leader worth following. 
It gave Scott a surge of confidence to still see these eyes looking to him. He took a deep breath and was ready. Sai, can you still get me to the Delta Wing? Through the chaos of powers and blaster fire, Nightclops flipped and spun to the nearest doorway. Sai had once more hacked into the system and opened every door to the Delta Wing, where a young superhuman, possibly as powerful as the toughest Avenging League members, was being held. A wild card that Nightclops had no idea about the mental state of, but she was now their only hope. Nightclops burst into her room. Three guards were still stationed there, but he made quick work of them with a kick, a chop, and an eye beam He pulled out his key from Sai and pressed it in front of the containment chamber, with text marking it, the Star Phoenix Stasis Unit. Fluid spilled out as the doors peeled back. The unconscious figure stayed floating in place, but as the last of the liquid pooled to the floor, her eyes shot open. She burst out of the chamber and grabbed Nightclops by the neck, lifting him off the ground with ease. Nightclops remained calm. We're here to free you, but we need your help. Back in the room, the fight raged on. Logan seemed to have a personal grudge with Jinx Strike and Saber Mammoth, and the three clawed beasts slashed gash after gash into each other. Psy and Cinder Knot hammered wildly at each other, sending shockwaves across the room, and Stormbird did everything she could to stop Magnaterra from getting to the kids. Going with her would be better than staying in the weapons hive, but just Barely, she wasn't exactly a great influence. But in a flash, everything stopped. Everyone was suddenly frozen in place, lightly hovering off the ground. Nightclops charged into the room, next to a glowing, green and orange deity-like hero from beyond the stars. I can't hold them for long, friend Scott. Which ones are our allies? Scott had her release his team, the kids, and Logan. While she held the rest in place, Scott and his team guided the kids towards the exit. Then finally said, We're clear, Star! With that, Star Phoenix collapsed the exit to the room and fired out of the facility. The heroes and their rescuees fled the scene, with Stormbird concealing them in a thick fog until they were well clear of the facility and safe. Back at the partially built X Tower, any wounds were tended to and the new team reconvened. The five fighters gathered in one of the completed rooms of the tower. So! What now, comrades? Robin looked at them all, then at the kids they'd saved, touring themselves around the building, excitedly picking out rooms. Now, Nightclops said confidently, we go find some more. As said, this world was continuously filling up with more and more young metahumans, who, under the right guidance, could become great heroes. And while still in the works, the X-Tower would one day be the perfect place for hundreds of young heroes to learn and hone their heroic destinies. Tara Lencher stared across the river at the Illuminous Corporation compound, sitting far too peacefully on a small island. Just the sight of it shot flashes of rage through her mind, but she remained composed. She imagined the whole place as it would be an hour from them, a crumpled heap of rubble. She turned and looked on her team, or at least the members that were present, all waiting on their first move. Despite their assorted flaws and past failures, Magna Terra was proud of them. Her time working under Slade Thanson had shown her just how important it was to fight alongside a group with unified ideals something she and Slade had never truly had. This, her new team, the so-called Sisterhood of Metahumans, were all willing to do whatever it took to fight what she considered the good fight and make the world a place where metahumans were given the respect they deserved as the future of humanity. It's time to make our grand entrance. Saber Mammoth, Jinx Strike, as soon as you find light, you bring him to the main hangar. I want him to watch as Cinder Knot tears his creation to shreds. She turned and raised her hands, which started to glow, sparking yellow. Then we end him. The earth beneath the team started to rumble, then a platform of rock lifted out of the ground and floated them all into the air. 
They soared across the water. Terra couldn't wait to see the horror in Bolivar Light's eyes as his metahuman crushing monstrosity was reduced to scrap. But of course this would all go much smoother if their mission wasn't interrupted, for once, by a certain team of frequent interlopers. Unfortunately, Terra didn't see their absence as likely for long, but luckily she had an inside eye, keeping tabs on them. As Magna Terra and her team hovered over the island, alarms started to wail. Two massive cannons lurched out of the ground and pointed towards them. Terra wasn't phased. She turned to her oldest ally, the brawling brute behind her, and asked, Are you ready, Cindernaut? He nodded and slammed two stone fists together. As the cannons below charged up, she raised a finger at Cinder. He floated off the rock. With a flick of her wrist, Cindernaut fired through the air at the first cannon. The weapon erupted in an earth-shaking explosion, and then, completely unharmed, Cinder rolled through the collision and charged towards the second cannon, which took aim on him. Terra smirked as she lowered the rest of her team to the ground, but just as they landed, a message came through on her communicator. It read, simply, the X-Titans are moving. Cindernaut continued to rampage through everything the compound could send. Cannons, tanks, guards wielding hard light weapons specifically built to combat metahumans. Cinder was a wrecking ball unfazed by it all. But his successful smashing of their current foes didn't change the fact that they had much more formidable ones on the way. Terra kept that information to herself, for now. Saber Mammoth and Jinx Strike bolted from Terra's side to go find Light. She just hoped they'd find him before the X Titans arrived. Too much of her team had personal grudges with the Titans for them to stay clear headed when Nightclops' team arrived. Cinder continued his smashing as Terra marched towards the six story tall doors of the main hangar. She raised her hands and thrust two massive boulders out of the pavement and hurled them forth. They blew through the doors, revealing inside the vile prototype she was so eager to destroy. The first so-called Sentinel of Light. All around it were guards who trained their guns on her and began firing. She pulled her boulders in front of her, easily blocking the blasts. She could have taken the guards herself rather quickly, but she figured Cinder would want the fun for himself, and she was happy to grant it to him. She glanced back across the yard to him as he finished off the last tank. Perfect timing. Cindernaut, I've got some more for you. His stony jaw shifted into a grin. She once more hovered him into the air, whipped him over at sound-breaking speeds, and hurled him into the hangar, bowling through five guards in an instant. Cindernaut was the one teammate Terra knew she could always count on. He had no personal vendettas or grudges, so far as she knew. He was just a loyal follower who loved to smash things, and his body being predominantly made of rock made him the perfect ally for Magna Terra, whose abilities allowed her to levitate and control minerals with her mind. Terra lowered her shields as Cinder smashed through the final guards, and just as he was wrapping up, Mammoth and Strike flung through some nearby doors carrying the Man of the Hour. They leapt over to Terra and tossed to the ground before her, Bolivar Light. But before she could even open her mouth to begin a monologue at him about how vile he was, another voice rang across the yard. Terra, stop! Terra could practically feel her teammates losing focus on the task at hand as she looked across the yard to see that the meddling X-Titans had arrived. Don't interfere, Scott, Terra said, still seething from the fact that her eyes on the inside hadn't given more warning of the Titan's arrival. We want the same thing here. It's in your best interest to let us follow through. Not like this, Nightclops said in a voice that Terra could only hear as self-righteous and ignorant. We can convince people that metahumans aren't a threat to the world, but not by being terrorists and destroying and killing whoever and whatever we want. If you kill Light, you're hurting our cause more than you're helping it. Terra sighed. 
We're not having this debate again, Scott. Try to stop us if you must, but this is happening, whether you want it to or not. I think you know that's not true. Star Phoenix, the green and orange clad hero next to Nightclops, thrust her hands out, but nothing happened. But of course, Terra knew that it wouldn't. Friend Scott, something is wrong. She must be blocking my powers somehow. Terra smirked knowingly, but before she could even give an order to her team, Saber Mammoth and Jinx Strike charged towards the Titans, both of them leering specifically at the stocky green ball of claws at the front of the pack. See, Terra had met Strike and Mammoth the same day that the Titans had met Logan Garfield, when they'd all invaded a metahuman experiment facility called the Weapons Hive. All three of these metahumans had been experimented on by a twisted man named Striker Blood, who'd intended to enhance them, then mind control them as his personal guards. Logan had been the most successful experiment in terms of enhancing his abilities, but Blood's mind control had never worked on Logan. The night of their invasion, Logan had left with Scott and the X-Titans without even trying to free Strike and Mammoth from Blood's mind control, which simply added to the years of bad blood between them all. Luckily, Terra had seen to rescuing Strike and Mammoth, and the two eagerly joined ranks with Terra after she allowed them to do as they pleased with Striker Blood. Cindernaut also charged into the fight, and Terra quickly turned back to light. It seems I don't have time to tell you just how vile an addition to this earth you have been, but at least you can watch while I- Terra stopped as she noticed his hands behind his back fidgeting with something. She grabbed his arm and pulled it forward, just in time to see as he pressed a final button on a device in his hand. And that final button read, Activate. A clanking of metal and a whir of machinery took both teams' attention as the massive, humanoid mech, the Sentinel of Light, illuminated and turned its eyes on them all. Cannon of light fired from the sentinel's eyes into the cluster of brawling metahumans, and they all scattered. The blast hit the earth and exploded, sending chunks of rock hurtling across the yard. Terra thrust her hands up and caught all the debris midair, keeping it from hitting anyone. Bolivar light fled in the chaos, but Terra didn't have time to care. She whipped back around and hurled all the debris at the mech. The rocks barely seemed to do anything, clanging off the thing's steel shell like pebbles. It stomped towards her, eyes flaring up again. Terra flew herself out of the way as another blast rang out. She looked the mech up and down and noticed a few slightly unprotected spots. Strike! Mammoth! Cinder and I will keep it distracted. You need to get to its neck to disable it. Strike and Mammoth both charged in. Terra hurled rocks one by one at the Sentinel, trying to keep its head turned from her team. But it wasn't working. The mech started to turn towards Strike with eyes flaring up, but before it could attack, a beam of energy fired from the ground at its head, knocking its shot just off course. Booyah, comrades! Silosis, Stormbird, and Logan from Scott's team were jumping in on the fight. Together, they managed to distract the thing enough for Strike and Mammoth to get to its legs and start climbing their way up its body. Mammoth struggled a bit as he was more of a brawler, but Jinx Strike was a nimble acrobat, and her glowing, pink-hexed claws dug into the Sentinel's armor just enough to allow her to climb up its body with ease. But when Strike got too close to its neck, the Sentinel swung an arm around to grab her. But quickly, Silosis' voice boomed from the ground. It's time for the Furball Special! As he hurled Logan straight at the arm. Logan drilled his claws into the Sentinel's hand and threw it off course. Jinx Strike shot Logan a skeptical, but somewhat appreciative look, as she finished her climb to the neck. Her claws lengthened further, and she slashed a flurry of swipes into the neck, sending wires and metal flying in every direction. The Sentinel slowed. It twitched and lurched and sparks sprung from it. Both teams moved aside as the bot crumbled to its knees. The lights faded from its eyes and finally it collapsed to the ground and shook the island. Terra and Scott's teams continued tearing into the bot, making sure it was totally out of commission. 
It was messier than Terra had hoped, but step one of their mission was accomplished. She whipped around to look for light and quickly spotted him. Nightclops and Star Phoenix were both with him. This is over, Terra. You've destroyed his Sentinel and given us enough time to make a case against him and his company. But if you kill him, you'll only be justifying his work. Now leave, please. I'm sorry, Scott, but I can't do that. And frankly, you have no say in the matter. Terra flashed a look at Star Phoenix and nodded. Star grabbed Nightclops and lifted him into the air. Wha Star, what are you doing? Her skin suddenly shifted from orange to blue, as she smirked and said, Oh, sorry, handsome, wrong star. My sister's actually taking a power nap right now, and uh, I think it's time for you to do the same. The transformation finished, and who was once thought by the Titans to be Star Phoenix shifted into her true form of Starstique. She hurled Nightclops against a wall, instantly knocking him unconscious. She grabbed Light and flew him over to Magnaterra. Despite Starstique not giving proper warnings earlier in the mission, Terra was once more thrilled to have her on the team. See, Star Phoenix and Starstique had been alien princesses in a royal family born with different abilities. Starstique had been meant for the throne as the older sister, but the blue skin she was born with had unsettled the population enough to deem her younger sister as the true heir to the throne. But when Starstique eventually discovered that her blue skin came with the extra ability to shapeshift, she betrayed her sister, jettisoned her to Earth, and took her place. Of course, eventually she was discovered and had to flee the planet coming to Earth to see what Star Phoenix had made of her life on the primitive planet. Soon after, she met Magna Terra, and a friendship blossomed from there. Now, Starstique was an essential ally in Terra's cause. The blue alien dropped light before Terra. She sneered at him and raised boulders all around him. For crimes against the metahuman community, I sentence you to death, Bolivar Light. He smiled snidely. By all means, monster, go right ahead. If you think the world will side with you after this, then go ahead and finish me off. We are the future of this world. We don't need anyone to side with us. Well, you'd better hope you're right, because my will dictates that as soon as I die, all my research and programs and schematics will be released open source to the entire world. So anyone will be able to make metahuman slaying weaponry. Who do you think they'll go after first once you've killed the man who tried to save everyone from the metahuman threat? Terra froze. Finally, Light had said something that gave her pause. At least with the Luminous Corporation being the only ones with these weapons, the problem was somewhat contained. Her entire body was tensed, as every fiber of her being wanted to crush light. But for now, she could see that that wasn't an option. The rocks around her lowered. His sneer grew. There. I thought you would see it my way! He was rocketed into the air as the earth beneath him shot upward. She may not have been able to kill him, but in the least she could give him a good scare. As light soared through the air, Terra looked over at Scott's teammate Stormbird. You'd better catch him, Titan. Stormbird flew up after him as Terra ordered her team to retreat. She took one last look at the shredded Sentinel of Light and all of the destroyed tanks and taken down guards to at least appreciate something they'd accomplished. But now, stuck in her mind, was the aggravating thought that Scott may have some semblance of a point. If Light's work would eventually end up in the hands of the public, maybe, just maybe, Magna Terra would need more of them on her side. Still conflicted, Terra and her team flew off, ready to prepare for their next move in the progress of the rise of the metahumans. Now, in a past tale about the Hell Manta, I alluded to a great but very angry hero of Atlantis. 
This hero's birth name was Arthur Banner. He was the son of a lighthouse keeper and a past queen of Atlantis, and while he grew up on land, he always yearned to go back to his ancestral home. The problem was, being half Atlantean hadn't granted him as many abilities as you might expect. His ability to breathe underwater never fully developed, and the pressures of deep waters were far too much for his partially human body. If he ever wanted to explore Atlantis properly, he'd need more fully developed Atlantean abilities. His need for this led him to becoming a biochemist. He studied everything he could about human enhancements and Atlantean DNA. He even researched old experiments of Barry Rogers, prior to his remergence to society, seeing if there was anything in his work that could give Banner the powers he needed. He ended up trying to recreate Rogers' accident in a controlled environment, and in some ways he'd be successful, but not in the way he'd hope. The incredibly high levels of gamma radiation Arthur would absorb would mesh with his Atlantean DNA and infect his whole body. It would have killed any normal human, but Arthur would survive to become a hulking green and orange version of himself as some kind of fish beast. After the initial experiment, he'd smash his way out of the lab, totally out of his own control, destroying everything in sight and going on a rampage. The army had come in to intervene, and he fled to the ocean. The next day, Arthur would awaken, washed up on shore, totally confused about what had occurred. He returned to his home to watch his own rampage on the news, but as he was watching it, his home was attacked, not by humans, but by the Atlantean military. It turned out that when he fled to the ocean, his Atlantean instincts had kicked in, and he'd swam to his mother's watery home and destroyed a large section of the city. As the Atlanteans tried to take him in, the confusion and anger boiled over in Arthur, and he once more turned into a brooding, monstrous version of himself. He smashed the Atlanteans and fled again, but while overall this was a devastating event, something good had at least come from it. Arthur realized while in his hulking state, his Atlantean genes were supercharged, meaning he could survive and thrive under the deepest depths of the ocean. Now all he had to do was find a way to remain in that state in full control of it, and try whatever he could to make amends with the Atlanteans. Luckily, he'd get an opportunity to do this when his half-brother, the reigning king of Atlantis, Orm Blonsky, would be envious of Arthur's strength and would get Atlantean scientists to try and give him those same strengths. This reckless act would lead Orm to becoming an abomination worse than Arthur's hulking form. Arthur would find out about this and return to Atlantis to defeat his half-brother for the Atlanteans. Well, it wasn't enough to fully gain Atlantean trust, it was a first step towards Arthur being able to fully reunite with his ancestral home, and the first bound in his life as a hero. Some heroes start their journeys with good intentions and evolve further into saviors from there. Hal Stark was not like that. While he was a genius-level inventor and an incredible pilot, these traits were overshadowed by his arrogance and apathy. He only cared about partying and drinking and gambling away his vast fortune awarded to him by the military aeronautics and space tech company he inherited from his deceased parents. The company was worth billions, valued twice as high as even LoxCorp stocks, because they were the first company to breach the intergalactic market, making sales to alien civilizations. And while Stark did little work for the company, he did enjoy flying their planes and ships for sales pitches off-world. During a weapons demonstration where Stark was flying a new military hypership around Skrulshan airspace, his heroic journey would get off to its rocky start. The ship he flew was the company's greatest creation, partially invented by Stark himself via some designs that he'd jotted down on a napkin on a whim. It was a ship whose weapons bay was replaced with nanites that could be structured into massive arrays of various weapons for different circumstances. Mid-flight, his ship was shot from the sky by Cretian extremists. 
Stark ejected, but it was only a second before the ship completely exploded, and in that explosion, Stark was seriously injured and knocked unconscious. When he came to, Hal was in a Cretian stronghold with a glowing green reactor built into his chest. His cellmate, who'd built the device, informed him that it was the only thing keeping him alive in the alien atmosphere, and without its healing properties, he surely would have died from his wounds. Before he could get more information, the Cretian extremists entered and told Stark he was to build them a new version of the hypership's adaptable nanite housing, specific to Cretian ship specs. If he refused, they'd kill him. And while being shown the specs of their ship, Stark saw in their stronghold they already had a vast array of his weaponry. Against his knowledge, his company had been fueling both sides of a raging conflict between the Cretian and Skrulltian empires of Mars. That sparked something in Hal. He now felt his company encouraged war instead of providing means to end them. It was a horrible thought and he had to shut it down. But first, he had to get out of there. He teamed up with his cellmate, an alien but fellow inventor by the name of Abin Yinsen. With further information about Yinsen's reactor, a device he referred to as the Lantern of Life, Stark realized that with some modifications, it could be powerful enough to control a new version of his nanites. So they got to work building, doing what they could to make it look like they were developing a nanite housing for a ship. In actuality, they were building a spacesuit. One both powered by the Lantern and made to house within it millions of micro nanites. The suit itself could now spawn those nanites and create any weapon the wearer could imagine. It was something Stark could enhance infinitely outside the walls of the Cretian stronghold, but for the time being it was limited by the stolen tech they had access to. This meant, on their escape attempt, there were malfunctions. As a result, to buy Stark some time, Abin charged a wave of soldiers, and in doing so, he unfortunately lost his life. That sealed Stark's decision to end his company's military arm. He escaped the stronghold and made waves in the news with his story of surviving and the announcements for his company, but soon after he'd make even more waves with his first public appearance as a new kind of superhero. He rebuilt his suit as a sleek and shiny superhero armor, referred to by the public as the Iron Lantern. He'd eventually meet and team up with other heroes of Earth, such as Barry Rogers, the Super Scarlet, and the Panther of Wonder, to help found the Avenging League. But even after that, he'd continue to build new Lantern armors and grant them to people he deemed worthy of wearing them, such as Pepper Ferris and Colonel James Gardner. Eventually, there'd be enough to make a small intergalactic corp of Lanterns who would protect not only the Earth, but the vast corners of the galaxy. Now with Stark's story, we scratched the surface of the cretian skrulltian conflict over Mars, but for our next hero, we must dive even further into that war. Back when Stark was in his late teens on Earth and totally disinterested in what his parents' company was doing, there was a test pilot who worked for the Starks named Carol Johns. Little did she know, one of the ships she was test piloting had actually been built by a Cretian inventor, who'd fled her homeworld of Mars to avoid being forced into the war, as she'd never fully agreed with either side's claim to the planet as their own. But her biggest mistake was taking a powerful Cretian energy core with her to Earth to use in her inventions. The Cretians wouldn't stand for its disappearance, and to send a message they sent a squad to Earth to kill the inventor and destroy the core. And when they arrived, the core just happened to be powering the ship that Carol was flying. Being an ace pilot, she managed to destroy some of the Cretian ships, but there were too many of them for her and soon enough, her ship was destroyed. But in the mid-air explosion, something strange happened. The core's energy was totally absorbed into Carol, who, though unconscious, didn't fall to Earth. She remained floating in mid-air. Curious about the occurrence, the remaining Cretians brought Carol back to their homeworld. The energy core had given her incredible abilities, ones that they thought they could exploit to their advantage. 
They took Skrullshin DNA and fused it into her, erased her memories of Earth, and crafted a whole new backstory for her. They made her believe that she'd been a Skrullshin shapeshifter warrior who'd been so appalled by the villainy of her own race that she defected to the Cretian side of the war to help them fight against her former people. And for years she would fight on their side until the fateful day that she was sent to shoot down Hal Stark. Before she could shoot him down though, the whole event started sparking some of her memories to return in flashes, her real memories. A Stark ship being shot down by Cretians just felt all too familiar. She ended up bailing on the mission and other Cretians were sent to take down Stark. She went in search of answers to her hazy memories. She went to Earth undercover to investigate the history of Stark aeronautics. There she found evidence of her life on Earth and it all came flooding back. She went back to Mars to free Stark, but by the time she returned, he'd already made his fateful escape. So from there, Carol went to the Skrullshins to determine if all the propaganda she'd been fed about them over the years was true. She found, well, they weren't the monsters she'd been led to believe, they were no saints either. So Carol spent the next years doing her best to moderate between the two groups, trying to build a peace between two races who both believed that the planet was theirs to rule. It wasn't an easy task, and Carol would often end up fighting with both sides against her. But she did make slow, painful progress, and hoped that one day she could bring an end to a war that she'd spent so many years helping continue. Billy Strange had been orphaned at a young age. His father had left before he was born, and his mother had died during a botched heart surgery. As he grew up, he made no effort to make friends. He buried himself in books, only able to ignore his loneliness while studying. A fellow foster kid he was raised with, Long Freeman, had tried to be Billy's friend, but Billy rarely gave him the time of day. By the time most kids Billy's age would be reaching high school, he was already graduating and accepted to a pre-med university program. He wanted to become the greatest surgeon to ever live, and make sure that nobody ever lost family due to a surgical error on his watch. He had noble intentions, but a terrible attitude, and little respect for the rules. Strange felt he wasn't being pushed through his schooling fast enough. He thought despite only being 16 years old, he was ready to become a full surgeon. So when he got word from his hometown that Wong Freeman had been in a terrible accident and was in need of surgery he couldn't afford, Billy bolted back home. He stole equipment from school and gave Wong the surgery he needed from his own bedroom. In the end, Wong would need to walk with a cane going forward, but he'd live and he'd keep full use of his legs. Strange felt vindicated in his arrogance, but of course this act of conducting illegal surgery with stolen equipment would get him thrown out of school. He'd likely even have gone to prison if it hadn't been for his age. He felt like he'd just ruined his whole life, until the day he was summoned to the Sanctum of the Gods. You see, Billy Strange had been watched over, unbeknownst to him, by Shazam, the Ancient One. She deemed that, well, he was brash and arrogant and irresponsible, he had a good, heroic heart, and was worthy to take over her powers before she passed on. Initially, Strange had no interest, until she told him that along with a massive array of magical abilities, he'd be given the ability to transform into a fully grown adult version of himself. In that form, he realized he could build himself a new life and get a second chance to become a surgeon. He agreed and began training with the Ancient One. Slowly through the next two years of teaching though, Strange would grow out of his desire to exploit part of these powers to return to his past ideal for his life. He soon found he had so much more potential to help people with his new mystical abilities. Though he had always been attached to the idea of being referred to as a doctor, so when his training completed and he revealed himself to the world as a mystical protector, he took on a name that technically he hadn't fully earned, but he felt justified in having all the same. And over the next few years, the whole world would be saved on many occasions by the great Dr. Zam.
Barbara Von Doom was a scientist and mysticism enthusiast around the time of the Second World War. She was aiding in the creation of weapons for the US military when the Panther of Wonder, Jadonna of Themaconda, joined the Allies' side of the war. Barbara was fascinated by the Panther and would question Chidonna endlessly about her homeworld and her powers whenever she got a chance. You see, Barbara wanted power. She'd always craved it, and she knew there had to be a way for even a mortal like her to attain it. Maybe, in Themaconda, she thought, she could find her own powers. But Chidonna couldn't take her there. For the time being, she'd been excommunicated for stealing the Panther suit and joining the world of man. But Barbara didn't believe her. She thought Chidonna was just being selfish, and so Barbara abandoned her career in search of Themaconda. Her family had possessed a vast fortune that had been left to her when they died. Their deaths had been reported as a mysterious accident, but Barbara had been there. She'd seen the other Von Dooms killed by a demon from another realm, a being they'd accidentally summoned by practicing sorcery. That was what had spawned Barbara's obsession with power. She'd seen the great might of that demon and wanted nothing more to be as formidable herself. So nothing out in the multiverse could ever harm her as that thing had harmed her family. After two years of searching the jungles of Africa, she finally found something. Not Themaconda, but still, something she was looking for. Grown over by the green of the forest was the ruins of a long-dead rival tribe to the Themacondans, the Cheetah tribe. And scouring through the ruins of their home, Barbara discovered the helm of the Cheetah, a relic similar to the Panther of Wondersuit. The wearer of the helmet was granted the mystical powers of a Cheetah god, and had been meant to protect the Cheetah tribe. Clearly the last one had failed. Barbara donned the helmet and was granted the incredible power she sought. But she wanted more. She claimed the abandoned land as her own and began building a kingdom there. She continued studying sorcery and was that much more adept at it for having the powers of a cheetah god at hand. After a few years, Barbara began practicing incredibly dangerous spells that put the entire world at risk of being invaded by creatures from beyond the realm. This was when Chidonna would once more take notice of her long-lost friend and set out to try and stop her from putting the Earth at risk. But Barbara had become incredibly powerful, and the Panther of Wonder would find her new greatest foe in the Cheetah of Doom. Now before we start into the tale of Pamela Octavius, I should give a quick history lesson of the heroes of New Gotham. The first hero to protect the streets was Bruce Blake, the Dark Norseman. He took down some corrupt politicians and fought a bunch of gangs to their end, alongside his ward Scott Grayson, aka Nightclops. But as global and universal threats became bigger and bigger, Bruce had to focus on the big picture, and leave heroing work in his old neighborhood to someone else. He had a falling out with Scott, who went off to start his own heroing team, so that left only one option. A young hero that the Dark Norseman had fought alongside a few times, Wayne Parker, aka the Spider-Bat, was getting into his late teens and had been fighting crime long enough that Bruce deemed him worthy to be the main protector of New Gotham. Blake began funding Wayne Parker's heroing career. With his aunt, May Pennyworth, serving as his aide, the Spider-Bat was tasked with taking down any new threat that would arise in the city. Unfortunately, that would be a bigger task than anyone could have expected. One of these new threats was Dr. Pamela Octavius, a genius botanical biochemist who'd spent her whole life trying to impress her mother, a woman who was not easily impressed. Pamela had been working on a project that many around the world were trying their hand at creating superpowers. With so many new heroes and villains arising, the ability to give someone powers was sure to be a profitable endeavor if achieved, and Octavius believed biochemistry was the best route. She was funded by New Gotham University, but they weren't willing to give her any human volunteers for her experiments until she had some real results. So she began testing on herself. She made dozens of concoctions of plant-based toxins and poisons, trying to give herself the ability to control plant life, a power she thought superior to most. 
And while the experiments would lead to some unfortunate side effects, like her skin changing color, Pamela would eventually achieve something at least close to her goal. She gained the ability to spawn tendrils of vines from within her body and control them like arms. She showed this to her colleagues and her mother, and neither of them gave positive responses. Her colleagues deemed it an inferior power, and they cut her funding in lieu of some other projects they saw more potential in. Her mother thought she'd turned herself into a disgusting monster, and didn't even want to look at her. This was enough to crack the good doctor. She went to New Gotham Central Bank and smashed down the walls, stealing all the money inside. The spider bat of course showed up, but with no prep time for a fight with a new foe, he was easily defeated. Octavius would use her stolen wealth to continue her research and expand her powers on a mission to prove that she could make herself the strongest being in the city. So when spider bat eventually did defeat her, this set her on a new goal, to kill the spider so he would never get in her way again. And to do this, she'd eventually see that she needed some help from other empowered beings in New Gotham. Five fellow inmates of Arkham Croft who also wanted to bring an end to the spider. Centuries before Shazam the Ancient One would teach Billy Strange about the ways of the wizard, she'd given her powers to two other beings by the names of Adam and Umar Dormu in the ancient city of Kondark. The Ancient One thought these two to have heroic souls, and that they'd be able to free all the slaves kept in the city if given enough power, and in a way, she was right. She trained them, and then Adam and Umar freed the slaves, but then they also went on a rampage, destroying the homes of all the royals and killing everyone who'd stood by and let their society be built on the backs of slavery, even killing their own father. The Ancient One tried to strip the siblings of their powers before they killed any more people, but somehow they'd become even more powerful than her. See, in secret, Adam and Umar had been training on their own in dark magic to expand their powers, summoning strength from the Black Dimension, a universe of chaos and death. When Shazam the Ancient One failed to defeat the siblings, she had no choice but to banish them to the very realm from which they'd drawn their extra power. But in this dimension, Adam and Umar would become more and more powerful over hundreds and thousands of years, absorbing the dark energies all around them and becoming demonic and mutated. They'd continue their magical training, eventually becoming some of the most powerful beings in the multiverse. Umar actually became more powerful than Adam and gained the ability to leap back to their home dimension, 5,000 years after gaining their initial powers. And to Adam's confusion, after she did that, she'd never return for him. Soon enough, Adam too would gain the ability to leap between dimensions and return to Earth, seeking the ancient wizard for revenge. But Adam would find that his sister had indeed succeeded in their long-desired task of killing Shazam the Ancient One. But his sister had then been defeated by a hero who called himself Dr. Zam. He was a sorcerer supreme who'd taken on all the powers of the Ancient One and then far surpassed her in strength. Furious about the loss of his sister, Adam would hunt down this new sorcerer and try his hand at killing him. To his dismay, he'd find that in this dimension, where Adam couldn't constantly be absorbing dark energy, he was not strong enough to defeat Zam. So Adam would return to the Black Dimension to scheme and figure out a way to lure his sister's killer to fight him on his own demonic turf. After five years of defending the world with the Avenging League and the universe with his fellow Iron Lanterns, Hal Stark was growing tired. It seemed with every villain they defeated, five new intergalactic threats would rise to take its place. The universe needed a new kind of hero, one that wouldn't tire or make mistakes. So Stark teamed up with fellow hero and scientist Hank O'Brien to build what they called Project Ultro. It was meant to be an artificially intelligent Iron Lantern suit that would be the first of many robotic heroes to endlessly protect the universe. And for a time, it actually worked. 
They built the Ultra Mark I, and he was a revelation. His first months on trial, he fought alongside Hal as well as many other Avenging League heroes, and he did great work keeping the peace. But little did the heroes know, the robot was learning more and more about humanity and sentient life, and it was slowly developing the opinion that sentient life could never truly be at peace. After his first months working alongside the heroes, Hal sent the Ultro Mark I off on his own to a section of the galaxy to do his work. Ultro set off to make a perfect world of one of the planets he was tasked with protecting, Corsicar. A few weeks into his assignment, though, Stark went off to check on Ultro's work. He was horrified when he found that Ultro had killed every single sentient being on Corsicar. When Stark found him, Ultro said he'd discovered the one permanent way to create peace, to kill all sentient life. Stark tried to take him down, but Ultro had learned every fighting tactic Hal had and easily outmatched him. Other Lanterns came to help, but Ultro managed to flee into the universe. Out on his new mission, Ultro upgraded himself, using technology he claimed from worlds that he began to purify, as he called it. He stripped away his creator's colors and remade himself as a golden being, set with saving the universe from itself. He'd even build his own army of fellow bots, renamed under his own new identity. And so the Sinestron Legion would become one of the greatest threats to all life across the galaxy, so dangerous that the Avenging League would have to team up with Amanda Fury's Suicide Guardians to have even a chance of stopping the Mechanical Menace. But even with all these heroes unified, it would be a long war to end the Age of Sinestron. Jaime Wilson intended on going straight into military service when he finished high school. With the world getting stranger and stranger, faced against more and more supervillain threats, he wanted to do all he could as a normal human to help. He'd secretly always hoped to fight alongside Barry Rogers one day, who just three years prior had remerged to the world after disappearing during World War II. Of course, nowadays he worked more closely with the Avenging League than with the US military, but Jaime still held hope, which would turn out to be justified. Jaime had a family friend named Aldrich Cord, who had once worked in the military but had since left a decade or so back and started his own R&D company, where he was developing new technology, some for combat services and some not. Jaime was headed there one day after school to talk to Cord. He'd been fascinated by a prototype flight suit Cord had been developing for the military called the Exo Falcon. It was a backpack that, when activated, spawned an armored wingsuit, partially inspired by the work of Hal Stark. But just as Jaime was approaching the building that day, the top floors exploded. It was a devastating event, but with a significant stroke of luck. The Exo Falcon pack had flown from the building in the explosion and landed right near Jaime. The attackers sprung from the building and were revealed to be members of the Sisterhood of Metahumans, working under the orders of the extremist villain Magnaterra. They had unfounded concerns that Kord's company was developing weapons to be used rounding up Metahumans, and they intended to destroy all his most powerful creations. But Jaime wasn't about to let them steal the Exo Falcon. He strapped on the pack and turned out to be a natural with it. Or, at least with flying in it. He started by trying to fight off the terrorists, but was clearly outmatched, not fully understanding how to use the weapon system yet. But Wilson wasn't one to retreat. He kept fighting as hard as he could, but wasn't faring very well. Parts of the suit started failing, and even in intense armor, some of the blows still hit him hard. With his hope of victory fading, Jaime didn't know what to do. Luckily, he held his foes off long enough for backup to arrive. In a flash of light, something zipped past him and barely audibly said, On your left. And in a few seconds, the villains were chained up and incapacitated, with Barry Rogers standing tall next to them. Jaime was obviously devastated by the loss of his friend, Aldrich Cord, who had died in the explosion, but the whole event spawned massive changes in Jaime Wilson's life, as Rogers had been impressed by the young hero's determination to best the foes, despite his inexperience. 
After some legal issues swept away by Hal Stark, Jaime was allowed to keep the suit, and while he wasn't ready quite yet to be accepted into the Avenging League, he'd become the go-to ally of Barry Rogers on smaller missions, which helped Wilson train to one day join the League. And in that time, he became very close with Barry, partially because they worked well together, but also because Wilson reminded Rogers of his long-dead ally from the Second World War. Or at least an ally that Rogers had always believed to be dead. Back in the Second World War, while one of Barry Rogers' only super-powered allies had been Chidonna, or the Panther of Wonder, she hadn't been the person he'd worked closest with. Wally Barnes had been one of Rogers' closest friends for years, even before either of them did military service. In the time Rogers would spend experimenting to try and turn himself into the super soldier he'd one day become, Wally would come of age to join the army. By the time Rogers would have his accident that gave him his super speed abilities, Barnes was already on the front lines. Of course, he never expected his longtime friend to become the superhuman face of the American army. Barnes was very eager when Rogers joined the fighting force, as the two were reunited and got to work alongside each other. At least, for a while. You see, Rogers and Barnes were spending much of their time with a small band of specialist soldiers trying to take down a Nazi rogue science division, led by Vandal Schmidt, a violent immortal who thrived in chaos. On one particular mission, Wally and Barry would come face to face with the Savage himself, while trying to destroy a train carrying experimental Nazi weaponry. The fight would come to a standstill when Vandal got his hands on Barnes, holding him by the neck over the side of the train as it passed over a cliff. He'd broken one of Rogers' legs, so the speedster had no way of saving his friend. Vandal demanded the answers to how Rogers had gotten his powers. Barry told him all he could, but the whole thing had been an accident. There was no way to replicate it. But that wasn't good enough for Schmidt. He hurled Barnes from the side of the train into the river below. Rogers would escape from the event, and his speeded up healing would get him back up and running in a few days, but he'd never find Barnes. It was assumed that his body had washed away into the ocean, but in actuality, Vandal Schmidt had sent his goons to recover Wally. He thought there was a chance that since Barnes had spent so much time with Barry, some speed force radiation could have sunk in to Barnes. His arm had been damaged badly enough in the fall that they'd have to replace it with a mechanical one, but that would only come to make him a more formidable foe, after years more of experimenting. Near the end of the war, Schmidt had been presumed defeated by Rogers, but nobody could ever confirm this as Rogers had vanished on his final mission, accidentally running fast enough to jump through time into the distant future. But Vandal had really taken his work underground and continued experimenting on Barnes' body, using him as the prime guinea pig in his attempts to replicate Rogers' powers. Eventually, they would make a breakthrough and give Barnes the same speed abilities that Rogers had had. And because of just how fast Barnes was, he was the perfect soldier for them to send on covert missions in Vandal's quest to bring chaos upon the world. Vandal would use Barnes as a brainwashed tool all the way up until Rogers returned to the world. Eventually, Schmidt would even send Wally to kill his old friend. It would be a painful reunion as Vandal's brainwashing would hold for a while, and Barnes would fight hard to try and kill Rogers. But with Jaime Wilson's help, Barry would manage to incapacitate Barnes, and with the Avenging League's resources, they'd do all they could to bring Wally's mind back so he could once more fight alongside Rogers till the end of the line. Now, while the Avenging League was busy handling the massive threats of the world, Wayne Parker was handling the surprisingly treacherous problems of the single crime-ridden city, New Gotham. As more and more threats were coming to power in the city, Parker needed help. When the Dark Norsemen had fought for the city, he'd always had Scott Grayson in his corner, but Grayson was off leading the X-Titans, and Parker only had Mae Pennyworth, though she could only really help with strategizing and intel. But just when it seemed like Parker needed one most, an ally would finally reveal himself. 
On a mission trying to take down Pamela Octavius, one of Parker's web shooters would be damaged and knocked from his arm. He'd later go looking for it, but never find it. That was because a 15-year-old aspiring hero named Jason Morales would find it himself and fix it, then even study it enough to make a second one for himself. He designed a makeshift suit inspired by the spider bat, and he'd go off into the night to try his own hand at crime fighting. Parker would quickly take notice of the boy and happily bring Morales under his wing as his sidekick. For a time, they'd work very well together, but eventually tragedy would befall young Jason. He'd be captured by the monstrous symbiote who laughs, Arthur Cassidy. Cassidy killed Morales just to torment Parker, and it would be the most devastating blow the spider bat had ever faced. But it wouldn't be the last time Parker would see his young ward. A while after the funeral, Parker would find that Jason's grave had been dug up. A secretive foe of the spider bats named Roz Warren, sometimes referred to as the head of the jackal, who was obsessed with the extension of life through cloning, had taken the body and replaced the vital organs with clone parts to try and bring the young hero back to life. See, Warren and Parker had long been at odds. Wayne believed that Roz's experiments were unethical, so in a show of good faith, Roz wanted to bring back Jason to try and win some of Parker's favor. And shockingly, the experiment would work. Jason Morales was resurrected, but he came back furious. See, when he came to, he found that Parker had once more captured Cassidy and had locked him away in Arkhamcroft, a place he'd escaped from half a dozen times already, and he was sure to escape again. Morales was livid that even after the villain had killed him and so many others, Wayne still hadn't been willing to break his one rule and slay the villain. Morales trashed Warren's lab and fled. He made adjustments to his equipment, building guns into his web shooters, and went out again under a new name, the Red Arachnid, determined to be the real hero for New Gotham, one who didn't take prisoners. Wayne and Morales would eventually meet again, but their reunion wouldn't end in reconciliation. Parker wouldn't be willing to arrest his old ward, and Morales wasn't willing to back down on his new mission. And so the two would carry on as divided heroes of the city, with Parker always hoping to one day turn Morales back to the ways of non-lethal justice. Now, Wayne Parker wasn't the only hero with a no-kill policy. Another who occasionally made appearances in New Gotham was the hero of the grimly named Hellhaven, a small city adjacent to New Gotham. Dinah Murdoch had been born a metahuman, with the ability to emit sonic screams from her mouth, but she'd long been encouraged to hide her powers by her father, Lamar Murdoch. Lamar owned and ran a small dojo in Hellhaven. He trained Dinah and other local youths, but would also hold fight tournaments at night to make extra money. Many local gangs would have their members enter and place bets on the fights. Lamar would let some things slide, but would always make sure that nothing explicitly illegal happened near or in his dojo. But one night when he was coerced into the ring, a shady politician who secretly ran one of the biggest gangs in the city, Wilson Dent, would send a fighter into the ring who had no intention of letting two people leave that arena. See, Dent had made dozens of offers to buy the dojo from Lamar and take over the fight tournament, but Murdoch knew the crook would let a lot of illegal activity slide, and there was no way Lamar was willing to let that happen. But soon enough, he wouldn't have a say in the matter. Dent's fighter took the brawl too far and killed Lamar in the ring to the horror of young Dinah. But because so many people feared Dent, everyone asked by the police would claim that it had all been an accident but Dinah knew better. While still only young, she'd begin stalking Wilson Dent. She wanted nothing more than to kill him for what he'd done to her father, but it went against her religion and what her father would have wanted her to do. Though that didn't mean she wasn't tempted. Then one day, she got an opportunity she felt she couldn't pass up. She found herself in a scenario where Fisk was alone checking in on a chemical factory that was a front for some of his illegal doings. The temptation overtook Dinah, and when he was close enough to a vat of acidic chemicals, she leapt out and bellowed one of her sonic screams to destroy the vat. A small frame of it shattered open and spewed chemicals across half of Wilson's face. 
He'd start to flee, and Dinah would try to chase him down, but before she could, the rest of the vat would explode and leak chemicals all over. She managed to climb up away from the liquids, but the fumes themselves were so toxic that they irreparably burned her eyes, causing her to go blind. Dinah would take this as a sign from God. She'd been punished for trying to kill, but she was also given a second chance to be a proper hero. While her eyesight being taken from her was a major blow, her sonic powers granted her some strange kind of echolocation that could allow her to navigate the world in a new way. She donned a super suit and mask to become the first of many heroes of Hellhaven, swearing to bring the two-faced king of the criminal underworld to justice the proper way. The streets of New Gotham are often under siege by a myriad of villains, ranging from your average street-level crook to the maniacal and sadistic killer, Arthur Cassidy. Luckily, the city has a resident hero who always fends off even the worst of the worst villains, the Spider-Bat, aka Wayne Parker. He's a hero who regularly takes on villains who appear to be punching way above his weight class, and yet he always eventually finds a way to outsmart or outbrawl them somehow even besting someone as powerful as Max Carlo, more commonly known as Claybolt. Carlo had grown up always wanting to be an actor. He loved movies and theater and craved to perform for the masses. But his father refused to pay for any schooling that had to do with the subject. He said the only way to make an honest living was to learn a trade. This was only a minor setback for Carlo, though. He went to school and became a lighting technician to work on movie sets. While he wasn't getting to act himself, he was at least near the action, meeting the right people, and paying for his own acting lessons on the side. At every turn, he'd try to talk to producers or executives about getting shots as extras or minor speaking roles, but was rejected at every turn, and told to stay in his lane. Until one day, someone from the camera department on the set he was working on told him that they were shooting an indie project on the side and were in need of someone with lighting skills as well as acting skills. Max thought this was perfect and agreed immediately, before knowing just how dangerous the job would be. The project was being shot with a tiny crew for one of the first scenes, and they broke into a chemical manufacturing compound. The lights Carlo had been given to set up had fraying wires and were not up to any production code. But he didn't care. He was getting his shot at the limelight. He started by climbing a ladder above the various vats of chemicals being brewed to hang one of the lights. But as he got the first one in place and plugged it in, it sparked and shocked Carlo. He slipped from his perch and tried to grab the light for balance, but it just fell with him. He plunged straight into a thick, pool of clay-like chemicals that burst into an eruption of electricity as Carlo and the fraying lights struck it. The entire factory lit up in a glow, which caught the attention of everyone in a mile radius, including a certain spider. The film crew fled as Carlo tried to pull himself from the sparking muck, which surprisingly seemed to be getting easier and easier. Soon it was like all the goop had disappeared, but that wasn't it. The viscous chemicals had absorbed into his body. He looked down at himself and his new form had altered into a massive mound of sparking electric clay. He lobbed his fist forth and easily punched his way out of the vat, then out of the factory, stumbling around trying to figure out what was going on. Spider-Bat, along with a news helicopter and a crowd of approaching civilians, saw a monster lumbering from the facility and immediately assumed the worst. New Gotham had a new villain. Spider-Bat sprung into action and Carlo's new chaotic form began firing off bolts of lightning that seemed like attacks, so Spider-Bat fought back. And as the two brawled, Carlo noticed the crowd of onlookers and the news copter. He wasn't acting per se, but he certainly had an audience and was ready to put on a show. Still not knowing much about his new body, he learned as he went, firing electricity and even shifting his limbs into clay hammers and clubs to swing at his foe. 
People cheered and cried as they watched the scene unfold, and Carlo reveled in it. He eventually stuck Spider-Bat to the ground with a giant glob of clay and fled, yelling, Till next time, Spider, when once more you'll be bested by the villainous Clay Volt. Carlo thereafter used his role of villainy that had been thrust upon him as a way to frequently be in the spotlight of New Gotham. He'd find ways to challenge Spider-Bat in public places and drink in all the cheers and jeers of an enthralled audience. But quickly, Spider-Bat would get too good at defeating Carlo, who'd end up imprisoned in Arkhamcroft, far from his audience. And so, a genuine hatred started to build for the Spider, and he swore to end his foe in an epic final battle and make it the performance of a lifetime that no onlooker would ever forget. Norman Freeze had much less humble beginnings than some of Spider-Bat's other foes. He was raised in a wealthy family and would grow up to create Frostcorp, New Gotham's leading technology innovations company. It was a place that Wayne Parker had always considered working at someday in his high school years, and luckily he had an in with the head honcho. Wayne was good friends with Norman's son, Harry Freeze. The two would often visit Frostcorp together and hang out in the ambiance of a bustling, innovative hub of science. Until Harry got sick. Wayne tried to stay updated on what exactly was wrong with Harry, but Norman was keeping the whole situation very secretive, simply saying his son had an unknown illness that couldn't yet be cured by modern science. A month into the ordeal, Norman announced that his own son had agreed to be put into a prototype cryo-chamber, where he could be frozen to halt the growth of his illness until a solution could be found. Wayne wasn't permitted to see his friend before Harry was frozen, and the whole situation felt incredibly suspicious to the young hero. He donned his costume one night and snuck into Frostcorp to try and get more information. He spent many nights looking through computers and files trying to piece together what was wrong with Harry, and eventually, the whole horrifying story fell into place. Norman had made his own son sick without his knowledge so he could show off the company's cryotech, then reveal a cure a year or so later that they already had prepared to further show off their innovative prowess and try breaking into the medical field. But Wayne wouldn't allow his friend to be a guinea pig or a poster child for the company's fake triumphs. He broke into the cryo facility to free Harry, but Norman was there working late. Spider-Bat confronted his friend's father as his alter ego, and Norman tried to fight off the spider to no avail. Enraged by Norman's actions, Wayne punched him far harder than he should have, and Norman sailed into a wall of vials that shattered all over him. A cloud of mist and frost burst around him, and he choked on fumes as his veins began to pulse blue. Spider-Bat stopped his assault and took the man to the hospital. Even in his rage, he had no intention of killing someone, especially his friend's father. But the next day, Norman was out of the hospital appearing totally fine. He masterfully spun the story to seem like Spider-Bat was a treacherous villain, trying to sabotage the company's work. He buried all evidence of his actions, and Spider-Bat was back to square one. He once again tried to break into Frostcorp, but when he got close to the building, he was struck from the air by a cannon of ice. Soaring around the building was an icy, cackling goblin of a man on a glider that spewed ice rays. The chemical cocktail that had spilled over Norman had given him the ability to transform at will into a frigid foe with enhanced strength and speed, and a body as hard as ice. From there on, he'd use this form to conduct all manner of corporate sabotage against rival companies, while using his wealth and position of power to keep all connections between Norman and the villain invisible. The only person who knew the truth was Spider-Bat, who swore to one day bring Norman to justice and free Harry from his frosty prison. Waylon Sitsevich had been labeled a freak most of his life. He'd been born with a minor metahuman alteration that did little more than make him odd-looking. He had scaly skin and sharp teeth, but no powers to speak of, so all his metahuman genes did for him was get him bullied growing up. Even his parents were off-put by his appearance. It was hard for him as a boy, but as he grew, he developed thicker skin, both 
on the outside and inside. He began using his appearance for intimidation, helping work his way up New Gotham's criminal underground. He bulked up to make himself more menacing and became a goon for hire. This position worked for him. His appearance had become somewhat of an asset, even if people in his line of work did still call him a freak. But eventually his job would get much harder, as New Gotham's first protector, the Dark Norseman, would start putting away waves of criminals, including Waylon, for a brief period. When the Dark Norseman would leave to work alongside the Avenging League on bigger, universal problems, Waylon would think his troubles were over. But of course then, the Spider-Bat came into the picture, and would once again get Waylon put behind bars. He needed to be stronger and better. He needed a way to defeat the Spider-Bat once and for all to keep his criminal career on track. Luckily, while locked away, he met someone who could help. Pamela Octavius, a brilliant and treacherous villain of the Spider-Bat. She manufactured a prison break where she and Waylon and many others were able to escape from Arkhamcroft. She then took Waylon to her secret laboratory where she told him she could enhance his metagenes, evolving his abilities to make him far more powerful. So long as he did criminal work for her first and foremost, she'd make him the strongest villain the spider had ever faced. Waylon was in. She brewed up a chemical concoction and scraped together a machine to embed that concoction into him. She even used rhino DNA to help ensure he'd develop even thicker skin and make him even tougher. And when she finally used her creation on him, he did certainly evolve. He grew bigger and bigger till he was over 8 feet tall with massive arms and shoulders. Horns sprouted from his forehead, and his strength and durability increased many multiples what they'd been before. He became a hulking beast that the media would eventually dub the Killer Rhinoc. And the first task from the woman who altered him was to kill the spider bat. Waylon, in his altered form, would certainly be a much more formidable foe to the spider and nearly kill him on their first encounter, but Wayne Parker was crafty, and like with every other villain he'd face, he eventually found a way to best the Rhinoc. This was enraging for Waylon, but only a minor setback in Pamela's plans to kill the spider. She simply wanted to see how Waylon would fare on his own, and this trial would only further prove something that she'd suspected. No single criminal could defeat the spider. It would take a team. A sinister group with an aligned goal to rid New Gotham of its precious protector forever. Felicia E. Nigma grew up watching her father's renowned criminal career. Walter Nigma had no power to speak of, but was still able to pull off some of the most elaborate heists in New Gotham's history. He taught Felicia that if you have brains, you can outwit any bronze. She grew up actively training her mind. She thrived at completing puzzles in all forms and always challenged herself to complete them faster and faster. She was a brilliant child who skipped many grades as she grew, all while being more and more inspired by her father. She got through university in a breeze with perfect grades and could have had any career she wanted. Her father had been trying to push her to get a proper job, though. The criminal life had worked for him, but he'd been pushed into it at a young age and simply made the best of it. He wanted Felicia to live an honest life. But when she was fresh out of school, her father, the brilliant criminal mastermind, was finally bested. Walter had mapped out an ingenious heist against a wealthy and shady politician, Wilson Dent. But halfway through the job, Walter was captured by the spider bat. Parker had been scoping out Dent and keeping tabs on Walter's career, and while he still had much work to do before taking down Dent, the spider bat was finally the first person to outwit Walter Nigma and put him behind bars. This was initially infuriating to Felicia, but eventually became intriguing. Upon visits to her father, he'd say that he wasn't surprised he'd finally been caught by someone and was impressed by his adversary. Felicia got more and more obsessed with the spider bat's work and wanted to see just how clever he was, and prove that she was even more so. She ignored her father's advice to lead an honest life and started setting up elaborate riddles around the city for spider bat to solve in a limited time. If he figured out the solutions, they'd lead him to a heist that she was undertaking in time to stop her. If not, she'd get away. She reveled in this challenge and never saw Spider-Bat as a true enemy, but a competitor in the arena of the mind. 
and she never enacted crimes that physically hurt anyone, so while Spider-Bat did always try to stop her, he never put priority on locking her away over some of his more deadly foes. But eventually something would happen that would pull Felicia out of her games. Her father was killed in prison. It had appeared to be just a prison brawl gone wrong, but the man who'd enacted the crime was a known goon of Wilson Dent. Even though Walter's heist against Dent hadn't been successful, Dent had still been embarrassed by how far the crook had gotten, knowing full well that if Spider-Bat hadn't stepped in, Walter would have gotten away with it. And so, he had Walter killed. This pushed Felicia over the edge. While toying with the Spider-Bat was fun, now she had her mind set on using her brains to kill Dent. This was when Spider-Bat finally had to put more effort into locking her away. He wasn't a fan of Dent either, but knew that killing him wasn't the right thing. He needed to prove Dent's criminal actions to the world, to have him locked away and make an example out of him. This is how the Riddle Cat became a proper villain to the spider. One he was always conflicted about stopping, but who he knew he'd eventually have to put behind bars. When the hum of Wayne Parker's spider sense began to rumble in his mind, he already knew it was going to be a long night, but there was no way he could have predicted the full scale of the chaos to come. He was mid-swing, well above the streets of New Gotham, when he whipped his head around to see a massive tangled claw made of vines zipping towards him. He twirled under it, looking towards the nearest rooftop, where Pamela Octavius stood with her usual cascade of vines shooting up from her back. Another two of them fired towards Wayne as he spun and twirled around them. He webbed the roof and shot towards her, cautiously. You getting slow in your old age, Doc, or are you just going easy on me? He got within a foot of her face and got his answer. Neither. She was baiting him. A sparking clay hammer smashed Spider-Bat from the air and slammed him to the edge of the roof. He quickly leapt up to see another of his more powerful foes on the rooftop. Clayvolt! Didn't I just put you away? Days are kind of blurring together lately, Wayne said, his eyes suddenly darting around for other foes. No prison can keep me from my adoring fans, and neither can you, Bat. The brooding amorphous thespian fired a cannon of lightning at Wayne. He let it strike him, and the shock just sputtered away off the spider bat suit. You haven't been an enemy of mine long, Volty, but one thing you'll eventually figure about me, I'm a fast learner. Pamela thrust herself off the ground on her vines. Luckily, I'm well aware of that spider, but I ask you this, are you a good multitasker? Her vines shot towards his head, but his senses began warning him earlier than they should have. Something else was coming. Instead of ducking, he dove to the side, just as two hulking, scaly arms smashed up from the roof beneath him. Pamela's vines hammered against Killer Rhinoch, almost sending him off the roof. Watch where you're swinging those things, Octavius. Wayne landed gracefully on the roof ledge. Rhinoch too, huh? You know, when I heard about the breakout at Arkham Croft, I figured this was coming. But knowing you, Doc, I would have thought you'd go for some of the brainier baddies to help you out. You got Vampire Bat or the head of the Jackal hiding somewhere? She sneered. There were more from Arkham Croft, but they didn't all make the cut. But luckily, you've got no shortage of people who wish you dead. Wayne's senses went again, and he instinctively leapt up. He passed right over a cannon of ice. Oh no, not him. Spider-Bat hadn't expected. Freeze. He was tackled out of the air by the Ice Goblin on his frosty glider. The day is here, Spider, where you meet your end and no longer trouble me or my work. Wayne swung an elbow back, but it was caught. Goblin spun the glider around rapidly in a circle, holding Wayne's arm and flinging his whole body around and around in a cyclone before releasing him and slamming him right into a brick wall. Wayne fell and was about to web himself to safety when an arm thrust out and caught him. Spider-Bat looked up to see an at least sort of friendly face. Riddle Cat, thanks. A woman in a green question mark pattern jumpsuit flung him up onto the building. It's always hard to tell with you, but I'm guessing this means we're sort of friends today? He asked. Tell me, Spider, she said. What word is spelt wrong in the dictionary? Oh no. She smashed her question cane against his head, then wrapped it around his leg and swept his feet from under him. He rolled out of the way before she could strike again. Sorry, sport, but you've gotten in the way of me killing that pig Wilson Dent for the last time. 
I had to handle you somehow. Wayne flung himself into the middle of the roof and spun around to take in the five foes around him. Well, I'll be honest, Cat and Frosty the Flyboy were a surprise, but is this really the best you could do, Pamela? Surely you could have gotten at least one A-lister. But then, Wayne was smashed from behind by a tendril that didn't set off his senses. He rolled across the ground and sprung to his feet, looking behind him. A chill ran up his spine as an eerie chuckle echoed across the roof. <laughs> How about me, Batsy? Do I count as an A-lister, or do you have a whole other category for little old me? Sauntering across the roof with goopy vines lashing off him was the worst killer of them all. The sadistic symbiote who laughs, Arthur Cassidy. Parker fired up off the roof to get some distance, but a vine snatched his leg and slammed him back down. He was then smashed from the side by Rhinox Horn and sent careening into Clayvolt. The mucky beast grabbed him by the arm and slammed him to the ground again, shattering part of the roof, before hurling him upwards. A cannon of ice blasted at him. Wayne spun in the air but only partially dodged it, having part of his leg coated over in ice. Riddlecat's cane hurled towards Parker but missed, giving him a chance to recover, but before he could land, Cassidy's tendrils had already latched onto him, pulling him towards the cackling madman. Say, did you ever play that game as a kid, where you catch a spider and one by one pluck all its little limbs off? Wayne swung his head and slammed it right into Cassidy. No, I wasn't a sociopath. Arthur laughed through the pain and slashed a claw through Wayne's shoulder. Oh, come, come, no witty little quips for me? Or are you still mad about me carving up your little sidekick? The mention of Jason Morales shot a bolt of rage through Parker, even though Jason's fate hadn't been as sealed as Cassidy may have thought. Wayne ripped his arm free and slammed it against his belt, expecting a cannon of sound to bellow out, his deterrent against symbiotes. But nothing happened. He tried again, but still nothing. Oh, don't worry, Batsy, I hear one in five men have that exact problem. <laughs> Arthur hurled Wayne into the air, thrusting a tendril up and slashing through his side. Pamela yelled up to him. You're not the only one who plans ahead, Spider. She said, pulling some kind of jamming device from a tangle of vines. She looked back to Cassidy. Finish him already. The longer he has, the more time he has to come up with a plan. Pamela thrashed a vine up and pulled Wayne back down to the roof. You said if I joined your little band, I could have my fun. So let me have it. He whipped his tendrils forth once again, but before they could reach, a barrage of bullets fired down from the sky at Cassidy. He whipped around just in time for a foot to slam against his face. Payback time, you sadistic freak. Red Arachnid fired a barrage of bullets straight into Cassidy's face, but only managed to irritate him. Who are you supposed to be, a thrift store knockoff? I'm busy with the real spider, scurry off. Arachnid said, not till you're a pile of purple paste. I'm gonna make sure I was your final victim. Wait, I do know that voice. You're the sidekick. I could have sworn I finished you off. You did. He pulled a flashbang from his belt and hurled it into Cassidy's tangled body. I got better. The light erupted, blinding almost everyone on the roof except for the spiders thanks to their masks and Clayvolt, who the light didn't bother. Jason continued firing relentlessly at Cassidy, but couldn't get a fatal shot in. Wayne tried to web the device in Pamela's hands, but her vines thrashed around in front of her, blocking the shots. Clayvolt charged at him and Wayne leapt around, evading the mucky brute's grasp. Thanks for the help, Red, Wayne yelled over the barrage of bullets to Jason. Gotta admit, I'm surprised to see you. I know you're not my biggest fan nowadays. Jason ducked under a swipe of Cassidy's tendrils. I'm here for him, but also... Wouldn't be thrilled to see you dead, I guess. That was the nicest thing Jason had said to Spider-Bat since his death. Jason had been resurrected after being killed by Cassidy, and had been enraged to see that Parker had refused to kill Cassidy even after that event, and after so many breakouts from Arkhamcroft. As the eyes of their foes cleared, chaos ensued. Jason was firing at Cassidy and dodging slashing claws from Rhinoch, Spider-Bat was trying to tear through vines while barely avoiding ice beams from above and Clayvolt's hammering fists. A swinging vine finally slammed against Spider-Bat, sending him flying across the roof to beside Jason. Red snarled, I've got some more flashes, but we're gonna need another plan. I've got something in motion, Wayne said, but it could take time. I may have to resort to fighting fire with fire here. He pulled a small vial from his belt. I really never wanted to use this thing. He popped off the lid, but the second he did, Cassidy could feel the presence. Oh, did you bring a cousin of ours along? 
He whipped a tendril and snatched the vial before its contents could escape. Jason, having no idea what the vial was, leapt forward and grabbed it, being pulled towards Cassidy. A black mass from inside leapt out of the tube and began crawling up and across Jason's arm. By the time he reached Cassidy, he was completely overwhelmed by his own symbiote, and slashed a massive claw across his foe's face. Cassidy cried out angrily, stumbling backwards as Jason landed and looked at himself. What is this? How did you have another of these things? Jason said through a jagged, toothed mouth back to Spider-Bat. The first time I fought Cassidy, Banebrock sacrificed himself to try and kill his and Cassidy's symbiotes. Cassidy's obviously didn't completely die, but neither did Brock's. I saved a small bit in a vial just in case I ever needed it. But be careful, Red. That thing can really make you lose control. He looked all over his altered form and felt the immense strength he'd just gained. He then looked around at the swarm of villains. I think I could stand to lose a bit of control right now. He thrust out his clawed arm. His wrist guns had gotten bigger, and he fired cannon-like blasts from them, first riddling Clayvolt with holes. The villain practically became Swiss cheese before Ice Goblin shot down towards Jason. But Jason whipped around and shot a tendril from his arm, ripping the rider off and pulling the glider right to him. Goblin crashed to the roof, tied up in a detached tendril, and Jason grabbed the glider and slammed the foot pedal, which activated the ice beam. It blasted right at Clayvolt, freezing him solid. Jason pointed it next at Rhinoch, but it wasn't as effective on him. The muscle-bound brute smashed through the ice and kept running at Jason. Jason sidestepped and grabbed Rhinoch by the horn. With incredible strength, he swung his foe around and hurled him up into the air. He then fired a tendril up, grabbed the brute, and slammed him back onto the roof, sending him crashing through multiple floors. But before Jason could turn to his next target, four vine arms fired forth and slammed him, sending him flying backwards, where Cassidy stuck out an arm and clotheslined him. Jason spiraled through the air and slammed to the roof. Impressive little tricks, kiddo. Maybe you'd be even more fun to fight than Batsy. Which means I guess I don't really need him around anymore, do I? A cascade of tendrils shot at Wayne. He dodged a few, but some finally grabbed him and pulled him towards Cassidy, who held up a claw to Wayne's throat. It's been a fun ride, Batsy, but I think this is your stop. I'd say I've still got a few more to go. Ready, Cat? Cassidy and Pamela's gaze both shot across the roof to Riddle Cat, who is now holding Pamela's jamming device. You made it sound like this would be a lot easier than it was, Spider, but yeah, I'm ready. She dropped the device and stomped on it, then plugged her ears. Wayne flung his arm around to his belt again. This time, an eruption of sound blasted out, shattering all the windows around them. Jason and Cassidy's symbiotes shrieked and shriveled away. Wayne quickly webbed up Cassidy, tapped his belt again to stop it, then turned back to Pamela. Five down, one to go. Cat, you traitorous fool, you could have finally ended him for good, Pamela yelled. Am I really a traitor if I was never really on your side in the first place? Like I said, Doc, I figured after I heard about the prison break that you'd be putting together a team, so I asked Cat to join up and keep tabs on your plans. She didn't tell me everything, or really anything, but I knew I could count on her to step in and help when I really needed her. Before he could finish his rant, a gunshot fired across the roof. Wayne whipped around to see Jason standing over the now limp, lifeless body of Arthur Cassidy. Red, what he- We don't kill people, how- You don't kill people, and that's why stuff like this keeps happening. Now, he'll never hurt anyone again. Wayne whipped back around to see Pamela fleeing across buildings. He stepped towards her to chase her, but then turned back to see Jason also running from the scene. Cat just shrugged and leapt from the building, swinging herself away. Sirens wailed in the distance as Wayne just stood over the webbed-up corpse before him. Even in death, a horrific grin was sprawled across his face. After all the chaos of the night, for better or worse, Arthur Cassidy had laughed his final laugh. Humans have long experimented on peaceful creatures of nature to create products for the goods of other humans, regardless of the harm it does to the poor animals. But nature has its way of fighting back, sometimes more ruthlessly than we could expect. The creature of the Louisiana swamps, often referred to nowadays as the swamp monkey, 
didn't have a name when he was the lab subject of a cruel doctor who was using him and several other Japanese macaque monkeys as his test subjects. He was attempting to make compounds that would grant temporary metahuman abilities to people, but was making little progress and regularly killed his subjects with his trials. Lucky for our odd protagonist, before the doctor could make it around to experimenting on him, an injured assassin who'd just killed the local gang leader stormed into the lab looking for a place to hide. The doctor tried to call the police, and the assassin shot him dead. Even luckier for the lab animals, the assassin, named Bryce Holland, was an animal lover. Well, he couldn't take them all back to their home in Japan, he felt the least he could do was set them all free. He opened the cages, and many of the monkeys fled into the swamp. All except for one. This one stayed and watched Holland as the assassin bandaged his wounds and used the lab as a temporary home. He trained with the myriad of swords, guns, nunchucks, and other weapons he had in a duffel bag he'd carried, and this all intrigued the monkey. The two became friends of sorts, even though the monkey had inherent concerns about humans given his history with them. After a week in hiding and recovering, Bryce thought he was ready to leave, when the gang, whose leader he'd killed, found him. They took no chances at Holland escaping and shot a rocket at the lab with Bryce and the monkey inside. The building exploded, sending the doctor's chemicals spraying all over Bryce and our monkey friend. The building collapsed and sunk into the depths of the swamp. Both of their lives should have ended there, but the swamp had different ideas. The mystical energy of the green of the swamp blended with the chemicals splattered all over these fallen primates. Parts of Holland's consciousness were salvaged by the swamp, and the monkey's body was reconstructed by the plant life of the waters. It's hard to say how much of the creature that emerged that day from the waters was Holland and how much was the monkey, but regardless of the blend, the creature was formidable to say the least. It had the fighting skills of Holland and the agility of a super-powered monkey, not to mention the ability to control and manipulate all of nature around him. That night began a new era for the Louisiana swamps. From then on, many tales would be made and told about the Swamp Monkey, who ruthlessly killed with a mossy green fist any who even accidentally harmed the swamp or the creatures that resided within it. Super Scarlet has had many adventures since coming onto the world stage as a public hero. She helped form the Avenging League, and has had many bouts with Loxie Lutherson, Slade Thanson, Sinestron, and many other devious villains. But none were as much of a challenge to her as the colossal, planet-destroying Doomatis. He was a creature from her original dimension, a place that had unlocked all the potential of magic, and had advanced science beyond near any other realm but they'd taken both too far and ended up bringing upon their own reality's destruction. Wandel, who'd eventually become Super Scarlet, and her late brother, Pietel, had been jettisoned from that reality just before its destruction, sending them both to our world. Little did she know, she and Pietel had been far from the only survivors of their home's destruction. You see, for decades before the destruction, a cruel scientist named Galen Bertron had been using magic and science to try and create the ultimate being, one he called Dumatis. One who could survive in any environment and even cheat death. The scientist subjected the being to hundreds of dangerous events and environments. Dumatis was killed by monsters, diseases, armies, and every time he came back to life, but was never able to die the same way twice. After years and years of this, Dumatis had become so powerful that he was like a near indestructible force of nature, and his regeneration would soon face its ultimate challenge when his entire universe collapsed in on itself. Everyone in the entire universe was killed, including Dumatis, but being cursed with inevitable regeneration, his body kept returning to life. He'd awaken in an empty nothingness, then immediately have his body atomized once more. Eventually, call it a merciful final breath from the fading sentience of his universe, or call it a deadly curse upon our own universe, but Dumatis was ejected from the last glimmer of his reality into our own, now infinitely more powerful from the countless deaths he died. 
He stood in our reality at nearly 100 feet tall. Spike spawned from his unbreakable stony skin, and he lusted for one thing only. Destruction. He began going from world to world, destroying everything in sight. He'd slay all the surface residents of a planet, tear the landscape to shreds, then dig his way into the planet's core and absorb all the energy within, leaving the planet a lifeless husk. He did this on dozens of worlds before the Iron Lantern Corps took notice. Hal Stark called upon the entire Avenging League to face the threat, but none could hold their own against the monster for more than a few seconds before retreating with major injuries. Except, of course, for the Super Scarlet. She used her incredible strength and speed and magic to its limits and beyond to try and defeat her foe, and she did eventually manage to kill him. Several times, in fact but every time he came back to life stronger and her previous tactics wouldn't work. Soon enough, they realized all they could do was delay the monstrosity. He'd keep seeking new worlds and keep destroying them, so what was there to do? Eventually, a new hero rose with an idea, one who was willing to lead the creature to worlds lacking sentient life that it could destroy without harming any living beings. It was a solution for a time, but perhaps that brave hero's story is one we'll return to at a later date. What's important for this tale is that someone was finally able to protect the universe from the destructive might of Dumatis. At least, until he runs out of lifeless worlds to destroy. If you asked J.R.S. Spector who exactly she was and what her background was, she'd have a hard time telling you. You couldn't even be certain when in her presence that you were conversing with J.R.S. Spector or one of her many other aliases. Kendra Grant, Shira Lockley, or even her heroic alter ego, the Moonhawk. All these different aliases have their own distinct attitudes, who would all give you very different answers in conversations. Though, I suppose alias is the wrong word. Better to say one of her other personalities. You see, Spectre has such a serious disassociative personality disorder that it borders on supernatural. Maybe even creeping past that border. See, at a time she was a police officer who became unsatisfied with her work and eventually moved on to military service, quickly rising through the ranks until she became a special ops agent, who would be sent on very dangerous undercover missions. She'd been sent to infiltrate a group of American smugglers who trotted the globe stealing other countries' artifacts and selling them on the black market. She fit herself into their group for a few weeks, learning what she needed to about their previous sales and storehouses. She was close to ready to take them down when they were all in Egypt together, raiding a recently uncovered tomb of the fabled Egyptian deity, Hawk Shu. Unfortunately, while on this raid, the smugglers finally discovered Spectre's identity and killed her on the spot. But her death wasn't final. You see, being killed in that tomb in the presence of the statue of Hawk Shu spurred the god to awaken and reveal himself to the nearly departed soul of Shayara. Thousands of years of his existence flashed before her, seeing that before he was a god on Earth, he was an ancient alien from a warrior planet across the galaxy called Novagar. He told her that her soul, being in a transitive state, allowed him to communicate with her, and that he could grant her his powers and return her soul to her body if she pledged to fight as the avatar of Hawk Shu, and rid this world of the vile beings who do harm to the innocent and the just. She accepted, and as claimed, she reawakened to the shock of the smugglers. The mace of Hawk Shu sprung from the depths of the tomb into her hand and caused a set of gold and white wings to spur from her back. With her newfound might, she quickly slayed all the mercenaries and reset the tomb to its former state of rest. For killing those she was meant to apprehend, Shayara was dishonorably discharged from military service. She returned to her home in New York where she spent her nights as a vigilante. To aid in her work investigating both street-level and white-collar criminals, she took on different aliases and occupations to blend in to different crowds. But the combination of attempting to maintain these different personas mixed with the terrible nightmares and thousands of years of memories swirling through her mind from Hawk Shu slowly weighed on her sanity. 
The turning point that made her finally snap was when a man with similar wings and a weapon to herself came to find her. His name was Richard Hall, and he claimed to be a Novagarian, from the same planet as Hawk Shu. He tried to explain to her how he was a reincarnation of an ancient Egyptian prince who had also been from Novagar, and how she somehow tied into his destiny, and they were meant to work together as intergalactic police. But it was all so confusing and conflicting with her orders and memories from Hawk Shu that partway through his tale, her mind snapped. She attacked Richard Hall, who defended himself, but eventually deemed it best to leave her be. She wanted no part in whatever he thought she was meant to do with him. Now, struggling to live a mentally stable life while juggling her multiple identities, not even fully sure who she really is, Shayara Spectre continues to fight as a vigilante, trying to serve her world for good, even at the cost of her own sanity. In the year 2099, or at least in one possible future version of 2099, the world has evolved. Technology has advanced, most old heroes who defended the world in our time have retired or sadly died, but of course life goes on and new heroes gain their opportunity to rise. Miguel McGuinness was one of these such soon-to-be heroes. He was in his late teens and working as an intern at one of the biggest technology innovations companies on the planet. Loxcamax. It was what our modern-day Loxcorp had evolved into, though Loxy Lutherson, while still alive, allegedly had no affiliations with it for some decades. They currently had a contract to develop a prototype military suit that was skin-tight to be worn under regular clothing, made from unstable molecule fabric, and gave the wearer incredible abilities. Miguel had heard rumors that it was heavily inspired by the final suit of the retired hero Spider-Bat, one he donned just at the end of his career. But Miguel wasn't interested in that. He wanted to make technology that could improve the lives of the everyday person. To try working his way up in the company faster, he'd often sneak into one of the labs at night to work on his own original tech. But that meant he found himself the only person on the floor one eve when someone else snuck in. Miguel hid and watched. The man looked nearly a hundred years old, but was surprisingly spry. Miguel didn't think he'd have to do anything to stop the man, as the vault that he approached, in which was the highly classified lab where the prototype military suits were being developed, had top-notch security. But the man had the door open in seconds. At that, Miguel ran to the wall and slammed a security button. Alarms blared and the old man ran, but not for an exit. He ran right into the vault, so Miguel followed. What Miguel saw in the vault shocked him. The suit in a glass case at the room center didn't just look like the Spider-Bat's final costume, it was his final costume. And it looked as though they were just trying to replicate that original suit. The old man smashed the glass and grabbed the suit, but when he whipped around, Miguel was in his way. Despite his shock at seeing the suit, Miguel told the man that he couldn't leave with it. Seconds later, three fully armed guards showed up, and upon seeing the suit, began firing on both the old man and Miguel. Miguel dove for cover, trying to say that he'd called them, and that he worked there, but they didn't seem to care. The old man put one of the suit's gloves on, and quickly used the web functions to wrap up the guards. He then ran over to Miguel, grabbed him, and told him to come with him. Miguel was confused and angry, but he heard more guards coming, so followed. They fled to a small stealthy ship parked on the roof, got in, and shot off into the night. As they flew, Miguel finally got an explanation, one he certainly didn't expect. The old man he'd just fled his company with was Wayne Parker, the original Spider-Bat. His identity had been revealed to the public near the end of his career, and after retiring, he'd become a recluse. Nobody had seen him in years. He'd been enjoying his retirement in peace when higher-ups at Loxcamax found him and came asking to buy his final suit, as they wanted to mass-produce it for military use. He said no, but clearly they hadn't taken that for an answer, as the suit was soon after stolen. Wayne knew Loxcamax's lawyers could spin anything to make sure he never proved they'd stolen it, so he decided to simply retrieve it himself. 
Unfortunately, now that Miguel had seen the suit, they'd likely do whatever it took to make sure he never let the information out that they had indeed stolen a super suit from a much beloved hero of old. Wayne claimed it wasn't even safe for Miguel to return home, as he wouldn't put it past Loxcamax to just have the boy killed to keep him quiet. Miguel was furious at his life seemingly being blown up in the matter of one evening, but he quickly turned to a solution. He asked Wayne to let him don the spider bat suit and investigate Loxcamax. He knew that with time, he could find definitive evidence of their criminal practices, as they must have done many more terrible things than just stolen a suit. If they could bring down the company, then there was no risk of them coming after the suit again, and Miguel could have his life back. It took some convincing, proving to Wayne how cunning and athletic Miguel already was, but soon enough, he agreed, and for the first time in decades, the world had a new spider bat, ready to continue the mythos of the great hero and go beyond anything the world had seen of him before. Selena Stacy was having a very strange week. To be fair, she rarely had what most people would consider a normal week, seeing as how she spent much of her days swinging around her home city, fighting crime and robbing the occasional corrupt business tycoon, dressed as the infamous Spider Cat. But this week was on another level. One minute she was investigating the latest schemes of the infinitely wealthy and underhanded billionaire Wilson Luther, and the next she was caught in the fire of some machine he'd had built that blasted her into what she eventually realized had to be another dimension. The city she appeared in seemed very similar to her home of New Gotham, and was even called the same. But from looking through local news, then scouring through the internet for any mention of her past actions, or those of Wilson Luther, soon revealed the truth of what had happened to her. Selena didn't seem to exist here. There was no news of her police chief father's death when she was young, the foster home she was raised in where she learned to steal didn't seem to exist, and any searches of Spider Cat autocorrected to Spider Bat and showed results of a vigilante that seemed to be this universe's version of her. Searching for Wilson Luther, with various terms relating to him added in, eventually resulted in her finding information on some equally wealthy man named Loxie Lutherson, as well as a local politician in New Gotham named Wilson Dent, who'd had half his face majorly burned off by an alleged local supervillain called the Devil Cry. Many of the people Selena was seeing in her searches had similarities to heroes and villains she knew from her world, but none of them were quite right. She started to think about why Wilson Luther, in her dimension, had been building a machine to transport people between dimensions. The last thing he'd said to her before she was shot away was, It's not always about the money, spider cat. What did he mean by that, and what was he after this time? But it would be some time before she ever got answers to her questions. Selena didn't know where to start looking for a way back to her own reality, but she figured a good person to ask for help was this spider bat, who she was picturing just being a male version of herself. The news she read all colored him as a dangerous criminal vigilante, and while nothing she saw showed irrefutable proof that he'd ever stolen anything or killed anyone, she assumed he was like her, a vigilante who remained on the fringes of the hero community, fought the crime lords she felt needed fighting for the greater good, while stealing what she wanted for herself from those she deemed unworthy of their own wealth and power. She decided her best next move was to track down this spider bat and see how much they truly had in common, and she'd soon find that it wasn't quite as much as she'd think. Tracking down the spider bat took a few days because he seemed as good at hiding in the shadows as Selena was, but eventually she caught wind of a battle going on across this universe's new Gotham, and she swung on after it. Selena's wrist-mounted grapple hooks and acrobatic skills from years of gymnastics, then years more of vigilante work, got her onto the scene pretty fast. 
At first, she didn't see the other spider, but soaring between buildings was some kind of human-bat hybrid that sort of resembled the lizard bat from her universe. While this bat was watching his back, Selina swung up and kicked him right out of the air. He flopped onto a building top, where she then landed too, but the bat was up again quickly, baring his massive fangs at her. He snarled and just repeated in a grim voice, FEED! 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 He leapt at her and she was ready to dodge, but then a barrage of goopy webbing splattered down onto the bat and pinned him to the roof. A figure shot down onto the building and hammered a fist into the bat's head, and he was knocked out, cold. Just the man she'd been looking for, Spider-Bat, stood up and said, You'd been doing so well, Kirkland. What happened? He looked over at Selina and thanked her for her help. He explained that the villain they'd just taken down was once a doctor named Morbius Kirkland, who the media had long since dubbed the Vampire Bat. And of all Spider-Bat's villains, Vampire Bat certainly was one of them. Kirkland had once been a world-leading researcher on bats, believing he could extract from them and their biology a cure for a disease he'd had since he was young, as well as find a way to give people the sonar senses of a bat. And in a way he'd succeeded. He used himself as a test subject and turned himself into a bloodthirsty bat-human hybrid. He'd gotten his bloodlust under control for some time, but something must have set him off that day, as that night he'd been on the hunt for a meal once again. Selina could tell that, well, explaining all that, Spider-Bat had been analyzing her attire and trying to decipher who exactly she was. She decided to cut off his guessing and explain her situation. Spider-Bat was fascinated by her story. He had minimal experience with the multiverse. A while back, a really annoying mech designer from another dimension had teamed up with him to help take down a villain of his called the Ice Goblin, but besides that, Spider-Bat had little information on other dimensions. Still, this Wilson Luther she described did sound very similar to a villain Spider-Bat was actively investigating, the politician she'd read about, Wilson Dent. He was a frontrunner to become the mayor of New Gotham, and Spider-Bat was an ally of Devilcry, who was far from the villain the news and Dent claimed her to be, so he knew that Dent was actually a thieving murderer who was just incredibly good at covering up his misdeeds. Spider-Bat knew it was a stretch, but suggested that perhaps this universe's Wilson was working on something similar to the machine from Spider-Cat's world, and perhaps that could get her home. It was the only lead they had, so the spiders dropped Vampire Bat at a police station, then swung off to Wilson Dent's latest base of operations. Quick interruption here to say that along with the brand new giant ink bundle that I have up on my Teespring store, I have put up a new Just Cool Stuff poster. And if you've never seen one of those before, my Just Cool Stuff posters are posters that each have 20 different of my favorite drawings on them. So if you want a whole bunch of my art on your wall, but you don't want to buy a whole bunch of posters, these ones are perfect. But anyway, back into more story and art. Let's go. Spider-Bat had been working diligently to prove Dent's criminal activity to the world before the election for mayor. Spider-Bat had no interest in seeing a crime lord run New Gotham from political office, so he'd been following Dent's actions and knew that Dent and his lackeys were currently running operations out of one of his front companies, a business that claimed to be working on a drug to help people get over intense phobias. But Spider-Bat had his doubts about their actual intentions. They snuck in carefully and used the vents to get down to the basement, where there certainly were people working on some kind of fear drug, but given the gas canisters and weaponry it was being loaded into, the spiders both quickly saw proof that this wasn't intended to help anyone other than Dent. They both crept through the shadows, searching for any sign of a machine similar to the one Wilson from Cat's universe had been working on, but there was no sign. That lead was quickly fizzling away, but while still believing themselves in hiding, Cat felt something sharp prick the back of her neck. She whipped around to see... her father. She was confused and didn't know if this was him from this universe or what, but he soon said, How could you become a disgusting vigilante, Selina? I was raising you to be better. Then, to her horror, his face started to decay and shrivel away. You're an embarrassment to our family, Selina. 
Her heart was pounding and her head spinning, but then Spider-Bat leapt past her and punched her father in the face. A tail suddenly sprung up from her father's back and thrust towards the bat. He ducked under it, rolled over to Selina, pulled a small canister from his belt, and sprayed it into her nose. She took a deep breath in, and the spinning in her mind slowly stopped. The image of her decaying father vanished, and she could see that the figure before them both was actually a man in tattered rags and a mechanical armor with a tail springing from his back that at the end had a needle dispensing some kind of green liquid. This was Jonathan Gargan. He was a disgraced psychiatrist who'd faced criminal charges and lost his medical license after testing dangerous fear toxins on his patients. He'd taken up a career as a private eye soon after to make ends meet, and soon found he could still use his fear compounds in his new line of work. He was often hired to find proof of adultery or some other misdeed, and he could secretly inject the people he followed with his fear compounds, then, in their horrified state, get them to simply confess to any unsavory acts they were involved in. This eventually put him on Spider-Bat's radar, and Spider-Bat had Gargan locked away for a few years, before Wilson Dent got him released, funded Gargan's work, and gave him enough resources to weaponize his fear toxins. Dent then sent him to kill Spider-Bat and any other vigilantes that tried to get in the way of Dent's work. Gargan eventually took on the alias of the Scarpion, and became one of Spider-Bat's more regular villains. Luckily, because of this, Spider-Bat had developed cures to his toxins, so Selina was in her right mind and back in the fight alongside the Bat quickly. It became a brawl through the lab, with workers fleeing and alarms blaring. Together, the spiders got Gargan to his knees. Kat still had the image in her mind of Gargan being her decaying father, and it made her livid that he'd put her through that. She tore off his mask, raised her clawed hand, and swung it down right for his throat. But Spider-Bat snatched her hand off its path. Spider-Bat was alarmed that she was going to kill him, and Kat was confused as to why he wouldn't let her kill one of his villains. Turned out their crime-fighting tactics weren't so similar after all. Selina soon found out that despite what the media had to say about Spider-Bat, he'd never actually stolen anything from anyone, and he certainly had never killed any of his villains. Something she was more than willing to do herself in the right circumstances. But their disagreement over Gargan's fate was soon interrupted as the big man himself, Wilson Dent, marched into the room and said, So, Spider-Bat, Kirkland and Gargan weren't enough of a distraction for you, huh? I guess I'll handle you myself. Before entering the base, Spider-Bat had explained to Cat that Dent was just as much of a physical threat as he was a manipulative criminal mastermind. He was six foot four and around 400 pounds. Spider-Bat didn't know if Dent actually had super strength, but he hit as hard as almost any of the Bat's villains, and would fight as dirty as he had to. Dent had worked his way up quickly through the criminal underground in New Gotham, and all the while had convinced the majority of people that he was an upstanding citizen who would be the perfect person to lead New Gotham into a brighter future. He practically owned the media and the police, and had both sides of the political spectrum eating out of the palm of his hands, despite being after nothing more than power for himself. In the early days of his criminal career, Dent had gotten a man named Lamar Murdoch killed. Lamar had refused to sell his dojo to Dent, where fighting tournaments took place that many criminal groups would participate in, and Dent wanted control over it. After killing Murdoch to acquire the dojo through other means, his daughter, Dinah, went after Dent and caused an accident that horrifically burned half of Dent's face, making him a very hard man to look at. But Dent being the master manipulator he was, had even managed to spin this in his favor, using his media influence to convince people that any critics of Dent were just put off by his appearance, directing people away from thinking about the genuine critiques of his political platform. He'd even purchased the new Gotham Mets baseball team to further solidify the city's love for him. Spider-Bat wanted nothing more than to take this man down, but he wasn't willing to go the same route Selina thought best a quick slash across the throat. Regardless, they had a fight on their hands. Bat webbed down Scarpion, and they both attacked a dent. 
Selena went in cocky and flew straight for a head-on strike, but he easily caught her fist and headbutted her so hard she practically got knocked out right there. Bat had more experience with Dent and tried to get around him to strike from behind, but Dent was still shockingly quick for his size and whipped his cane back striking Spider-Bat from the air. Selina shook off her blow and slashed at Dent's ankles. He raised his foot up out of the way and stomped down onto her. She let the foot come down onto her and she was pretty sure he cracked her ribs, but she was able to catch his leg then tear through his Achilles tendon with her claws. He stumbled back and she shot her grapple hook right at his shoulder and yanked. She intended to pull him down, but he was too sturdy, so she adapted and pulled herself to him and hammered her foot into his nose. He slammed back into a wall and spat a glob of blood from his mouth. He remarked that she was much more of a brutal fighter than Spider-Bat. He then plucked a gold coin off the top of his cane, flicked it into the air, and said he'd let fate decide if she was going to die that night. Before the coin could come down though, Spider-Bat shot over and kicked Dent's legs from under him. He slammed to the ground and both the spiders leapt up to get a strike on him, but he rolled away from them both and was on his feet quickly. He cocked his fists as if ready to continue the battle, but then heard sirens from outside. He snatched his coin and ran from the room. The spiders both tried to follow him, but he slammed a button that started closing blast doors behind him. The last thing they heard from him was, Tomorrow's papers aren't gonna paint you too kindly, new spider. A green mist started spraying from the ceiling and the spiders didn't wait around to see what it did. They fled back through the vents and searched the perimeter for Dent, but he was nowhere to be seen. They were no closer to getting Dent's criminal activities made public or to getting Selena home, and on top of that, they weren't so sure their crime-fighting approaches were going to work well together. Selena would stay in this dimension for some time and occasionally work alongside Spider-Bat, but the relationship between the spiders would never be as clean or simple as either of them hoped. Still, for the time being, this universe's new Gotham would largely benefit from having another crime-fighting spider swinging through the streets, seeking justice. I hope you enjoyed this compilation, and if you did, you might also like my more recent videos on DC villains as Marvel heroes, or Marvel heroes as DC villains. But besides that, I'll leave you all with a positive or inspiring note, today coming from a man named Garain Jones, and it's not a specific quote from him, but he is a man who I heard him tell his story a while back about how he went to prison, losing all his freedoms, and that was the place where, for the first time in his life, he felt like he truly found his freedom within himself. And he specifically said, nobody can truly take away what you have within yourself. That's not to excuse any situation where someone has had their freedoms taken away for unjust reasons, but it's just a great reminder that we have so much power inside ourselves to feel the way we want to feel, and we don't have to be controlled by external circumstances. I hope that's inspiring, I love you all, and I'll see you when I'm back from vacation. Goodbye.